time together, uh, in which we can inquire into the nature of our own existence and uh, get more, hopefully, more sense of the direct nature of experience, which can allow us to be more present moment by moment. So perhaps we just to arrive and settle down, since it's a bit jumbly getting in here, we could just focus on the breath for a short period of time. Some of you are very familiar with doing this, some not. Just allow your body to relax, but to let the skeleton carry your weight, so the muscles can be easy and relaxed. And focus on the movement of the breath as it goes in and out of the nostrils. The eyes are gazing down the line of the nose, not wide open, but not shut. Shoulders dropped and relaxed, and the tongue resting on the part of the palate. And if your attention wanders off to anything else, to thoughts or sensations, <coughs> you just very gently bring it back onto that focus. Gentleness is the most important aspect of this. Most people have experienced quite a lot of harshness at various times in their life, sometimes directly from other people, sometimes due to health reasons, sometimes due to internalizing messages of driving ourselves and forcing ourselves to achieve things. But what we are engaging in is an approach to ourselves. And you can't get close to yourself if you treat yourself as the enemy. So it's about just very gently refinding your balance. Focus on the breath, we go off, and we just gently come back to it. Generally speaking, in Buddhist practice, uh, we begin by taking refuge. <laughs> Essentially, that's a way of thinking about what it is that we do normally take refuge in. Always, moment by moment, we're relying on something. We can rely on our thoughts, our memories, our intentions our friends, our roles in life. Um, there are many, many sticks and props that we use to give ourselves a sense of balance and direction. The question is, how many of these things that we rely on are truly reliable? <coughs> if you are crossing a little river on wobbly crossing stones, that are placed in the water. You often have to run quite fast because your momentum carries you over even although they're wobbly. And that's often how we're living in life. We're zipping from one thing to another to another in a state of uh, slight excitement, agitation, in order to keep a sense of the ongoing movement of our existence. When we stop and look at what we're actually trusting and relying on, Often, the particular functions don't seem to be able to carry our weight. For example, <clears throat> health can come and go, occupations can come and go, people close to us who our lives get mixed with also come and go. <clears throat> in these situations, we can feel bereft, because in reliance, we go from a vertical relationship to one where we're off balance, but propped up by the other. It may be a mutual thing, so that we form an A-frame, so we're both propping each other up. But if one moves, then the other starts to wobble. So the great function of meditation, more spiritual practice, 
is to find a way of grounding oneself and centering oneself so that one can be open to life, responding to the various situations of life, but not becoming off balance. <clears throat> off balance occurs according to the Buddhist tradition when we become attached. That is to say, where we create an image of the other, whatever that other is, a role at work, children, being around the house, partners and so on. And that image of the other becomes something stable in our mind so that we think in terms of them. And we imagine a future where with the presence of that kind of occupation or activity will offer us a continuing point of reference, a continuing sense of who we are. And yet everything is liable to change. With this uh, economic climate, many people lost money in investments, people's plans for their future, the value of their pension goes down, and they have to rethink how they will be. Ideas which have been some kind of comforting notion for the future starts to be, feel like a persecution. Why is my life becoming less safe? Who are these people who have done these things to me? But perhaps what has made our life less safe has been the fantasy that it was more safe. That it has never been safe. There has never been a time in human existence when life has been sorted. There have always been dangers of some kind, <coughs> whether it's wild animals or invaders or volcanoes. There's always something which is moving around because this is a moving world. In the outer field of the climate <coughs> and international trade and the value of markets, all the outer phenomena that we encounter are prone to, to change. Somebody has a, a good idea which transforms things, for example, the introduction of pesticides, transforming agriculture, there are going to be more crops, and then after some time people realize, oh, these pesticides are actually toxins, all the little birds are dying, human beings are being poisoned as well. Same with asbestos, when it was first introduced, people were very excited. It's a wonderful cheap material, provided insulation, protection against fire, and so on. And then after some time, we start to realize this is really a dangerous, poisonous substance. So, we as human beings are very prone to investing something with value, and then being very disturbed when new information shows that people's misplaced trust. So, so what is this desire to rely on phenomena? From this point of view, our, the subject and the realm of its experience arise together. We are always in contact with something. Since we woke up this morning, we're in relation to the environment around us. We engage in movements towards the world that also affect us. So we pick up our toothbrush, we ourselves squeeze the toothpaste on the tube, but somehow, as soon as the toothpaste is on the toothbrush, our mouth opens. <laughs> and <laughs> we are doing this. So it's as if the toothbrush is making us our mouth open. <coughs> and action and reaction is on all the time. You make a cup of tea, and then your hand has to lift it and your mouth has to drink it. The cup of tea is making your body do something. So our volition, our movement as an agent out onto the world is also inviting the world to act onto us. And the movement between subject and object, between the subject and the field of experience is continuous. The question is, is the subject part of the field of experience or apart from the field of experience? Mm. We'll explore this in more in detail over this time, but essentially our subjectivity seems to have two aspects. One is the aspect of involvement, in which at the moment, say, I am talking with you, 
you are looking at me. There is a sense of something going on between us. So the thoughts and feelings that I have as I'm speaking to you are arising in connection with you. That is to say, the contents of my mind are communicative. They're not something uh, like a box that I'm living in. But they're actually bridges between the environment that I inhabit and my own sense of self. And this sense of self is also constituted out of our memories, our hopes, our fears, all the things we've experienced. So we have an internal flow of potential, and there is an outer field of potential, and these two are constantly shimmering together. It appears to us that we are ourselves, that we are an autonomous agent, mm -hmm. a subject that has a degree of self-definition. We have, as it were, a life of our own. And this is a life then which is important to us and which we want to protect. And yet this life <coughs> is called into existence through our relationship with others. It is given meaning and value through our relationship with others. And it mobilizes itself continuously in the field of others. Even if you live on your own and you don't have much contact with other people, everything that you touch, everything that you do, is produced by other people. The cup of tea you have, you didn't grow the tea. The water that you have for it has been supplied by the water company, which is people out digging ditches, keeping the reservoirs going and so on. The, the illusion of autonomy, the illusion of being a discrete individual is the source of a great deal of suffering and confusion for us. This is the basic Buddhist notion that there is no inherent self-nature in the subject. That is to say, we don't exist as a monad. We're not wrapped in some kind of skin or shell although we can often feel ourselves to be that, because we have a, a kind of ongoing self-referential function. That is to say, we're constantly scanning what's happening to our body. So even if a tiny fly lands on your face, you're immediately aware because of the sensitivity of our nerve, the nervous system. Is this good? Is this bad? A continual uh, process of evaluating is there an advantage for me or a disadvantage for me? Mm -hmm. This basic sorting out of feeling tone is part of being in the body. Because of form, we move into feeling the attribution of pleasure, pain, <coughs> neutrality to whatever's happening. This interaction gives us no peace. We often feel disturbed by what is going on. I, it's all too much. Leave me alone. I can't cope. These are quite common feelings for people to have. And that's because the amount of stuff that is going on around us is more than the little pot of ourself can bear. So when our subjectivity is sealed inside this skin of self-concern, its limited shape gives it a limited capacity, and that's the basis of being overwhelmed. <coughs> that's the nature of our subjectivity in interaction with the world. But we also have a capacity for awareness. This awareness is relaxed, open, when we uh, rest into it, when we're at home in that awareness, we find that it has no particular shape. It doesn't have a taste. It doesn't have a color. It doesn't have any identifiable qualities whereby we could compare and contrast it with anything else. It just is what it is. And what it is, we can't even say. So there is an undeniable givenness or facticity to the immediacy of our existence, but this quality 
is not something which can ever become a tool, a resource that we use. When we think in that sort of language, it's as if the tail is wagging the dog. Because awareness is the ground or the basis out of which the gestures of creativity, which of the field of all our experience arise. That is to say, I'm talking at the moment. I'm aware that I'm talking. There's also an awareness of being aware that I'm talking. Because awareness is, is a kind of Janus head. It faces in two directions. There is an awareness which leads into involvement as the conscious object, the identification, I am talking. But there's also something much more spacious, uh, a field of openness which reveals each thing as it's arising. It's like a theatre stage in which character after character comes on, does the momentary improvisation and moves off. Or it's like the sky in which ceaseless new patterns of clouds appear and pass through. So. <coughs> when we come to thinking about taking refuge, the first thing we want to do is to inquire into what is it that I rely on and what is the nature of that reliance. So, for example, when I went for a walk up the road, I put on my socks and shoes first because I have a sense that the, the road has stones on it and it's likely to be muddy. So, I'm relying on the socks and shoes to provide a buffer zone between the sensitive surface of the soles of my feet and the cold, sharp surface of the road. I want something to mediate, to act as a go-between, to uh, lessen the impact of what's occurring. This is very normal, that we have a sense that raw experience would be undermining of who we are. So we all have many, many methods of providing that mediation. Nowadays, most people have central heating systems, they have mobile phones, which are all ways of ensuring that the lines of communication with the world feel as if they're in the palm of our hands, that I can control how the world is going to impact me. This is the essential quality of the ego's domain, to want to be <coughs> in control, to develop a sense, I can live life on my terms. This is something for us to think about. If you reflect on the last year, how much of that life has actually been, been lived on your terms? Things have happened to all of us in this room, and we found ourselves reacting. How we are now is not how we imagined our lives to be a year ago. How could that be? And even the year before a year ago, maybe it was the same thing. And the year before that, and the year before that. That the fantasy that I know what I'm doing is a comforting illusion. And the reality is, I find out what I'm doing when I get my instructions from the world. <laughs> I'm not in charge, I'm just a foot soldier. <laughs> Events tell me how to be, what I have to do. <clears throat> the, the purpose of reflecting in this way is to start to see that Although I have been reactive, that doesn't make me a helpless puppet. It's actually pointing to the fact that there's a lot of resilience in our nature, a lot of capacity for movement. So rather than being trapped into a sense of, I have to dominate what's going on, <coughs> the capacity to flow with events is pointing to the softness, the malleability, the creativity, the potential of the way we come into becoming in new situations. So the actuality of the flow of becoming 
is, can be hidden by having a rigid story about ourselves. But we try to impose the continuing story, I know who I am, I know what I like, what I don't like, and this is my existence. <coughs> Actually, our existence is revealed to us through the many different ways in which we become. From, if you take that latter view, the rigidity of our view about who we are becomes a limitation to the free movement of becoming what it is necessary to become in the environment. <coughs> in the traditional Buddhist language, this is uh, understood in terms of the relation between wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is to recognize the ungraspable openness of our being, that awareness itself, our basic presence, is not an object in the world that can be caught, <coughs> manipulated, or pushed into particular shapes. And therefore, there's nothing to be done with it. It's a done deal. It's already there. It is what it is. All that's required is to relax. You could say that all meditation is essentially an elaborate trust exercise. Some of you may have done that where you work with a group of people and they form a circle around you and you close your eyes and just fall and people prop you up in various ways. Or you have to stand on a chair and fall forward off it and people in the group will catch you. And it can feel quite scary because the idea that you would trust your own basic physical existence to other people, maybe people you don't even know very well, that's quite scary. Is there enough good will in the world? Or am I the one that has to always take care of me? <coughs> that root sense, it's all up to me, is very strong for many of us. But in meditation practice, we are relaxing and releasing the particular tight spirals of <coughs> habitual conceptualization and self-definition, which mean uh, if I release my attention, if I don't know what's going on, I will be in danger. From the meditation <coughs> point of view, if I keep observing everything in this weary, aroused, critical way, I will always be in danger. So there's a paradoxical flip that we have to go through in which we trust <coughs> that non-conceptual being in the world is safer than relying on concepts. That concepts are tools to be used, they're not things to rely on. If you're eating, then having a knife and fork is useful some of the time. Chopsticks are useful at other times. Maybe using our hands are useful at other times. It depends on the situation. We don't walk around with a, a knife and fork in our hands in the hope that we'll find something to eat. <laughs> Some animals seem to have to do that. They have their little beak all the time is looking for food. We human beings have a much wider range of possibilities. So when we need to eat, we get out the knife and fork. And when you finish eating, you leave the knife and fork. If you took the same view to thoughts, I'm thinking about this in order to solve a particular problem. When I've done the thinking, I don't need to think about it anymore. But when you start to meditate, even doing this very basic, just tracking the breath in and out, we find our mind going off into these familiar loops of thought. Why? What function does having this mental knife and fork have for us? What good food are we chopping up? Nothing at all. It's not necessary. But our mind gets so used to being about something, of needing to be of use, that metaphorically we're there, knife and fork in hand, busily making sense of the world, interpreting what is going on. Perhaps we could allow ourselves, just for a short period of time, to be useless. That nobody's asking anything of us. 
we're just sitting here. If you fall asleep, that's fine. All that's asked is don't snore too loud. <laughs> Not many demands at all. So, but what what should that what should I be doing? Surely I should be doing something. Don't I have to find a purpose in my life? Otherwise it's all just meaningless. I have to make meaning. Oh, this is a traditional existential dilemma that's set out by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and his later writings and so on. That we, we find ourselves thrown into a world in which we're offered various methods of generating meaning through our parents' rule books, through the religions that we're brought up in, through the kind of schools that we go to. But at a certain point, usually when we're teenagers, we start to put these into question. And we find that the cocoon that was wrapped around us is unraveling. And these big questions arise. Yeah, but is that really true? Can I trust that? What does it mean? I, um, if that happens, we are then condemned as individuals to make sense of our lives. And that's the basis of a great deal of busyness. What does it mean? Well, for this short period that we're here together, everything can be meaningless. It doesn't mean anything at all. If you drink a cup of tea, what kind of tea do I drink? There's quite a lot of choices here. Will I have a banana or a tangerine? What does it mean if I've chosen the banana? Hmm, what would Sigmund Freud say? Now <laughs> <laughs> what Freud would say? He'd <laughs> <laughs> probably say you like your mother. <laughs> so, things just happen and they are what they are. That is to say, we could, you could live your life through different dimensions. You can live the life through analysis, trying to generate meaning, which tends to mean comparing and contrasting what's happening in the moment with previous experiences. That is to say, weaving together a narrative which gives an account of what's occurring, which allows it to be contextualized in terms of what's happened before. But you can also live your experience in terms of aesthetics. Some of the furnishings in this room strike me as somewhat bizarre, but <laughs> clearly somebody thought they were okay and they went out and they bought these and stuck them on the wall in these particular patterns. If you were simply to live here in terms of shape and color and experience these shapes and color through your belly without uh, getting into art history or whether it's kitsch or whatever identification you would have and just see how it registers. Do you open to something? Do you close to something? That's also a way of responding. However, generally we find we return to our particular opinions that we like something or we don't like something. This is a taking of refuge in my habitual patterns of interpretation. As long as we do that, we have the advantage that it returns me to myself. Every time I experience something new and I interpret according to my own frame of reference, I'm validating the fact that this is how I am, this is how the world is for me, these are my values. There is a, an affirmation of the continuity of the stability of me being myself. That is to say, all the infinite possibilities of the world, the many different ways that we see human beings respond, are rejected by us, and we follow our own little tunnel, like a mole under the ground, pursuing the maintenance of our particular frame of reference. This is the ordinary pattern of the ego taking refuge. I choose these things because I like them, and that's not just because they taste good or they look good, 
but because they're affirming the continuity of me being myself. If I was to do something different, who would I be? I wouldn't be me. To step out of the familiarity of being who you think you are is to enter into a world where you don't know. Why would you choose not knowing when you could stay with knowing? That's a very big question. In the history of Buddhism, when Prince Siddhartha was uh, young and he was living in the palace, he was introduced to a very uh, enjoyable kind of experience. Whatever he wanted, whatever uh, desires he had were immediately gratified by the courtiers around him. But he found that this domain of pleasure was a, a kind of self-sealing intoxication. And one day when he was out with his uh, attendants, he saw a sick person in the road. And he thought, oh, people get sick. In the palace nobody is sick because his father had instructed that if anybody was sick they should be immediately removed from the palace. And he started to think, if they get sick, maybe I get sick. Then he saw a very old person. He thought, oh, everyone around me is young and beautiful and handsome and healthy. What is this strange kind of old person wandering along with a stick and a bent back? Where do they come from? So he realized, oh, I will also get old. And then he saw a dead person, his corpse lying at the side of the road. <laughs> Nobody I know dies. Everybody is having a good time. Maybe I will die. And then he realized that this bubble that he had been invited into was like the description of the, the island of the Lotus Eaters in the Odyssey. It's a place where you go and you forget. It, it seems intense. It seems real. But there's a foreclosure. Uh, an editing out of the rich array of existence, and you're getting only a very narrow slice of it. It may be very delicious, but it's not very good for you. Just like eating cream cake all the time. With that <coughs> understanding, he left the palace. He left in the middle of the night. Because he couldn't explain to people why he would give up all that was so wonderful all the things that many of the people living outside the palace would be desperate to have, why would he give it up? And also, why would he upset the people who were very close to him? His wife had just had a baby. So many people couldn't make any sense of what he did. And they said, be with us. Stay in our world. It all makes sense. Why would you want to disrupt this? What are you looking for? Ah, these yogis and philosophers, they're all mad people. Here you look, you have two, two dinners a day, you have two <coughs> horses. What do you want? But in the history of Buddhism, we say that that primary disruption was very helpful because it caused him to have experiences whereby he could see that what had been presented to him as the truth was just a story. Inside that story, because of its regularity and predictability, there was no contradiction. And therefore, the repetition of these experiences through time seemed to generate a facticity. It must be true because it's always been like this. But he started to realize, actually, it's not always like this. It's only like this if these uh, forces of cause and conditioning are maintained. When I step out of the palace, I'm in another world. Because now nobody knows who I am, and they don't treat me as a great king. They treat me now as somebody who's begging for food. And so he was insulted. He was put down. He had so many disturbances to the sense that he had of who he was. And gradually... <clears throat> The, the matrix in his mind, the interpretive schema that he had, started to dissolve. 
That is to say, he could no longer rely on his assumptions about who he was and his place in the world and how people would be. Because, of course, when he was in the palace as the prince, everybody was very sweet to him. Everybody bowed to him and they all smiled at him and laughed at his jokes. When he was outside the palace wall as a beggar, people were throwing stones at him and saying, you know, go away, leave our village, what are you doing here? We don't want you. I'm the same person. Don't you know who I am? But of course, <clears throat> there's then the question, who was he? He was no longer a prince because he wasn't in the palace. Princes don't go begging in a village. Princes don't walk around without shoes and half naked. Princes don't have lice in their hair. So he couldn't be a prince. But I am a prince. So, according to the tradition, for seven years he wandered around up and down the banks of the Naranjana River, having many kind of experiences like that. And gradually, the princeness was washed out of him. He started to see that being the prince was an identification, a particular pattern of possibility of being that is only available if you follow certain rules. It was a, a rule-generated role, and all roles operate inside systems of other roles. So, then he was forced again and again to the question, well, who am I? Oh, I'm not a prince anymore, I'm a yogi. So, from in these years, he was doing many different kinds of yoga. After six, seven years, he started to realize, I've studied these different kinds of philosophy, I haven't really got anywhere. I've done these many kinds of physical yoga, raja yoga, and so on. I haven't got anywhere. They haven't helped me to find out who I am. So, according to the tradition, he thought, I've had enough. Very luckily, um, a young girl had just been making some kheer, some rice pudding, and seeing this poor, scrawny little <laughs> shrunken person, she offered him some out of compassion, and he ate this, and he suddenly thought, hey, this is better than Hatha Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, this ground is very hard, why am I doing that? I don't need to be an ascetic anymore. So he got some kusha grass and made a little seat, and he sat on it under the tree, and he thought, I've had enough. My belly is full, my bum is comfortable, I'm not moving until I get enlightened. I'm not going to do anything. So he just sat there. And many different thoughts arose inside. He had many hallucinations, dreams, fantasies, many demons came and so on. He said, nothing to do with me. I've given up. Go. He just sat and sat and sat. And suddenly, life became much clearer to him. And then he touched the earth. The earth, according to the tradition, had three earthquakes, which probably wasn't very nice for the other people. <laughs> <laughs> Showed that he was enlightened. <laughs> and from that, he, uh, the Buddhist teachings derive. And there are many, many different interesting aspects in this story. He, he awakens from the enclosure of assumption of what's given. And he goes into a period of restless striving. That's probably what most of us have done in our life. You know, when you hit puberty and you come into these turbulent teenage periods, you start to put everything into question. There are advantages in that, but in a sense, there's no end to questioning. See, we keep questioning and questioning and questioning, but then at a certain time, we suddenly realize that. I'm middle aged. How did this happen? How did the great turbulent questioner be quite grateful to know, you know, when the shops close and to know when I'm going on holiday and that's enough? And this is the real danger for us. The Buddha, in that sense, was lucky that he decided all assumptions are dangerous. 
whether they are profane assumptions of endless sensory enjoyment, as in his life in the palace, or holy sacred assumptions, as when he spent these years as a yogi going through all sorts of intense practices. Instead of relying on cultural forms, whether they're seemingly good, seemingly bad, self-indulgent, altruistic, not resting on any formulation, he gave up. He gave up being somebody who needed to rely on someone. <coughs> he gave himself to the space just to see what will happen. And as experiences were arising, he didn't identify with them. Why was that? Because he didn't need them. He was no longer constructing something. As it says in the Dharmapada, <coughs> the, the this house is broken, the roof is off, the beams are collapsed. The, the, the construction, the making of an edifice of the self was no longer necessary. Oh. At home, at peace, as what? Can't be said. Being itself is undeniable in its experience, but inexpressible. Because it's not a thing. Language is concerned with the discourse of forms, of entities. Mm -hmm. We talk in terms of qualities of things, whether they're good or bad. We like them, we don't like them. But the mind itself is not a thing. But that was the real beginning of Buddhism. So when we talk of taking refuge, traditionally people say we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, in the Sangha. This is a way of reorienting oneself away from habitual fixations. But in the Dzogchen tradition that I'm particularly connected with, the prime refuge is in one's own nature. This is not a narcissistic self-centeredness. It's not about affirming the importance of oneself, but it's rather to inquire into who is the experiencer. We're all sitting here in this room, we're having different kinds of experience. We have narratives about that experience. I like this, I don't like it, I don't understand what it's saying, I'd rather be back in bed, I don't, can I go for a walk? All sorts of thoughts can run across our minds. These are storylines. When we rely on the storyline, even if that story is composed in terms of I would like to or I don't like to, the I which is embedded in the narrative is not the true experiencer because you are aware of the storyline. Of course, sometimes we merge into the story and it's just our whole experience. But we, we're also, time from time to time, we know what we're thinking. If we know what we're thinking, that which we're thinking can't be who we are, because it passes. So when we make these strong statements about ourselves, the subject is being misidentified as the content, the ephemeral content of what's passing. Because before breakfast, you might have had the thought, oh, I'm hungry. Then you look at the various things that are available here, and you think, oh, I'd like that. Ooh, I couldn't eat that. Ooh, not in the morning, but I'd like that. <laughs> so in that moment, you feel that you're saying something definitional about yourself. <laughs> then you eat that. And it's gone. Somebody said, would you like some more? No, thank you. But you said half an hour ago, you really liked it. I don't like it now. You're not very reliable. Have some more. Eat the whole damn box. No. <clears throat> so there we see that the, uh, this eye sense is like a cuckoo. 
jumps into someone else's nest and takes it over as if it's theirs. I is inserted into these moments of experience and seems to give a false continuity as moment by moment through the day we can formulate descriptions of our experience in terms of I. I like, I don't like, my back's getting a bit sore, all sorts of comments we can make. This is the realm of illusion because in the intoxication with the narrative storyline, there is always another chapter, always another storyline that we can follow. The real issue is who is the one who is aware of the story? The reason I'm setting it out like this is to try to uh, give a sense of the area of work of meditation. In meditation, we're seeking to relax our identification with narrative storyline. To cease our identification from the sense of self as I, me, myself. That is to say, a proposition which is inserted into the stream of thought. Last night, when people were arriving, they meeting each other, they introduce each other, oh, where are you from, how was your journey, what did you do? Everybody's got something to say about their life. When you're called in to say, how was your journey? For some people, the journey was four hours long. Oh, it was not so bad. Four hours is condensed into not so bad. <laughs> in that four hours, many, 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 many things happened. But we can't give an account of each phenomena that was experienced. In this way, we can see that language is very useful, and it's also stupefying. If when you're intoxicated in language, what you're actually doing is weaving a shared realm of connection with other people. That is to say, language belongs to the domain of compassion. Language used well is a very sweet way of getting close to other people of understanding their world. Not because of the semantic content of what they say, not because of the believing necessarily in the truth of what they say, but of the tone of voice, the gestures and so on, whereby that meaning is conveyed. What language can't do is enter the domain of wisdom. Wisdom is outside language. And if you try to gain access to wisdom through language, you, you go off on the wrong road. There, these are two parallel roads, the road of direct experience and the road of narrative. <coughs> narrative is the road of compassion. Used well, it's the bridge that links us to other people, that allows us to be helpful and useful in many different ways. But wisdom requires us to move away from intoxication with thoughts, and thoughts here means thoughts, feelings, sensation. Because even when a sensation arises in the body, it's very rare that we stay with it in its raw form. It gets wrapped into an interpretive structure very quickly. The same with our feelings. You feel a bit strange about something, and you make sense of it by telling yourself a story about it. So when we come to do the meditation practice, we're not trying to do something new. We're simply relaxing the energy from its habitual path of projection or interpretation. That is to say, we're doing less in order to find the infinite. When we do more, we get more of the finite. Because our activity takes us into the precision of being with others moment by moment, or being with ourselves, with our particular thoughts and feelings and so on. The infinite is always there. From the very beginning, our own nature has been completely pure. There is no contamination present in anyone here, in anyone outside, and not even in the sheep, not even in the SAS. <laughs> <laughs> So these poor men are condemned to missions that they are not in their control, which is ethically very troubling, I'm sure. 
when you, what does it mean to say that our nature is pure? It means that the heart of our being, <coughs> our openness, is not a thing. If we were to have a very wild party tonight, we could write all over the walls and the ceiling, we could dig up the floor, people would, people would be vomiting on the carpets and so on. And I'd lose my deposit. <laughs> everything in this room can be hit by something else. As soon as you have an entity, an entity exists in relation to other entities. And when entities come together like motor cars, you get a crash. When entities come together like a mouth and toast, the poor toast gets crunched to death. <laughs> it's very sad. <laughs> However, nature has revenge sometimes with rice because you get a stone in it and breaks your teeth. <laughs> in that way, the, the finite forms of the world mark each other. Traces are left. This is the meaning of karma. That we do an action as a person, I like this or I don't like this, that is to say, I'm coming into shape with a particular desire or an antipathy, a, an aversion, and that shaping of myself brings me into contact with another shape in the world, such that some business is transacted. Either I allow things to grow and develop well, or I squeeze them and crush them and cause some harm. The shaping is finite, that's what we mean. It's limited, and every limited thing has an edge. And the edge of limited things can come in contact with the limited edges of something else. So, for example, if we're sitting and talking together, and just chatting, we, can, we need to keep an eye on how we talk to other people. Do we talk too loudly, too long? What are we trying to say? What's our intention? So, that way we learn to modulate our being in the world with others. But, we can, of course, get things wrong. That is to say, our world of interaction is full of limitation, marking, and mistaking or erroneous action. That is to say, we get a poor level of fit. It's not pure in that sense, because it gets marked. You know, if <coughs> yesterday, before we came here, we went for a, a walk with uh, some dogs, and we were walking on slightly marshy ground, and then when I arrived here, I marked walking about on the, on the floor, and then I started seeing, oh, there's bits of mud everywhere, I'm picking up the mud, and I realized the mud was coming off my shoes. <laughs> so, in, in that way, marks are happening all the time. The floor, as it were, becomes impure. It's not a great disaster for the floor to have some mud on it, but if, if you like, the floorness of the floor, the simplicity of the floor, is altered by having mud deposited on it. We, when we look at the floor, our gaze is now on two things, the floor and the mud. We see there is something not quite right. The mind itself has no shape, no color, it's ungraspable, it's a presence which reveals itself not directly, but through the potentiality for experience, the flow of becoming which is arising moment by moment. That is to say, we've been sitting together now for a while. Many different experiences have occurred. <coughs> These experiences move together in and out, often going off in a distracted thought, coming back and so on. Each of these thoughts leaves a kind of trace, a kind of mark, because we can remember what it was. We can scan back through time, we can scan forward through time, making projections, planning, what am I going to do next week, and so on. 
<coughs> the mind itself is something unmarkable. No trace can be made on it. It's always pure because it's not a thing. Things are marked. The ground of things is not marked. In the Buddhist point of view, there's a, 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 another aspect to this, which is the bridge between things and no thing. Mm -hmm. If the mind is not a thing, if it's like empty space, you can't grasp it, and yet, here is a table. We can grasp the table. It has a solidity. It has a shape. We can estimate how much weight it can carry. We have all sorts of memory banks of data that can lead us to propositions about the table. If we say, well, the table is just an experience, how, how does this experience stand in relation to the open nature of the mind? We have openness, we have the integrated field of experience in which our relative subjectivity arises with the objects that are in this room, and then we have our precise gestures moment by moment. Moment by moment, something is always happening. We're leaning forward, we're leaning back, our eyes are closed, our eyes are open. We are embodied, but we're not <coughs> embodied inside a skin bag as an autonomous agent. We are embodied within the field of experience. Embodiment is a field factor, not a personal state. Because without the environment around us, we wouldn't have a body. <clears throat> the body is composed out of all the constituents of the world. So when you eat your breakfast, you take things which are grown somewhere else, which belong in the world, that contain the vitamins, minerals, and so on, and you put them into your mouth, and they become part and parcel of your body. The body is constructed of the same phenomena as the world. They are not two separate domains. The body is the field of experience. Where the mark occurs is in the forgetfulness of the non-duality of what we take to be the subject or what we take to be the object, that the field is integrated. You're sitting here, you look around, you see more of the room than you do of yourself. You get more roomness than meanness. That's always how it is. You see the walls, you see people's heads, you see the color of their clothes. You don't see your own body. You have to look down, look at your own feet. If you do that, someone will say, oh, what's the matter? Because it's not very normal for us to be checking out whether our feet are still there. But we're quite entitled to look around if you sit in a cafe. You see people looking, other people chatting, and see, look at people walking up and down. If somebody's sitting in a cafe and they're looking at their hand, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, our world is revealed to us through our participation with others. And that participation is not something which requires a big decision. It's not as if there is a huge threshold between me and the world that I have to step over. Although psychologically it can feel like that. If you suffer from depression or anxiety, it's easy to feel, I can't cope with it, I don't want to go there, it's too much. Where is it you want to go to? Out of my flat. I need to do it, but I can't do it. But you're in your flat. Okay, so where do you want to be in the flat? I'll be in my bed. <clears throat> okay, but your bed is still another object. Couldn't you just be inside yourself? It's impossible. Because your body's got to be somewhere. <clears throat> Either you're standing up or you're sitting down or you're lying down. There's not many options. If you're standing up, you're standing on something. If you're sitting down, you're sitting on something. Lying down, you're lying on something. The body is not freestanding, it's not floating in space. 
the environment and how we are are linked together. The key point from the meditation practice is to see that the field of experience is inseparable from the ground of experience, which is open presence. And within that, the solidity of the table is a conceptual understanding. That due to the nature of my embodiment, I experience this table in a particular way. If I was a fly, the table would reveal itself in a very different way. Music, sorry. Suddenly, <laughs> oh, there is angels. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a visitation. Somebody's <laughs> trying to come here. Tracy, hello. <laughs> <laughs> a message from a lost soul. <laughs> so, what seems to us as self-existing, as truly what it is, is an interpretation. It's an interpretation which, because it's validated by other people in the room, is taken for granted. This is a table. Nobody here would disagree. We are maybe 40-something people. In the next field, there are more than 40 sheep. If we collect these sheep and we bring them in here, and we ask their opinion about the table, <laughs> what sort of response will we get? <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> the tableness of the table depends on our human mind standing in relation to that. We also know that there are people, human beings, who don't look so very different from us, who live in other environments, maybe in the Amazon jungle, maybe in Papua New Guinea, for whom Having tables is an unusual phenomenon. They don't have need of these things. They probably don't have a word for it. So, the givenness of the table. Since we were born, we've been looking at tables because these are pervasive in our Western culture. It comes to appear as something which doesn't exist simply as a mental event. It seems to have a validity. But we say table. Table is an interpretation of a particular shape. The tableness of the table is not in the table. <clears throat> there is no tableness of the table. When the mind which experiences this phenomena says table, the table is evoked and called into being. <clears throat> when you were a child, this would have been a marvelous thing to hide under. And if you could persuade your mom to give you a sheet, you would drape it over the top and you'd have a little world inside. Because for children, tables as places to sit and eat are, means it's a moment when you have to behave yourself and be quiet and not put your elbows on the table and not slurp your soup and all sorts of things. So the top of the table is a, a realm of control by adults. But under the table, now that's a place where big people don't go. So that's very nice. This under the tableness is invisible to big people. But dogs and children know it very well. <laughs> the, the purpose of <coughs> pointing to this is to see everything is experience. What you take to be objectively existing is experienced by you, interpreted by you, according to the patterns, the habits, the learning that you have accumulated through life that will be influenced by your family of origin, your DNA, the kind of school you went to, that brings you into your own unique experience of these phenomena. So when we use language, we are compassionately creating the illusion that we live in the same world. Because when we all agree that it's a table, we now have a, a common denominator. Oh, we can agree about something. We might not agree about politics or economics, but we can agree about the table. <coughs> but we don't have access to each other's experience of the table. What we actually live with is our direct experience. What is that? So here again, you can see the, the distinction between wisdom and compassion. 
Wisdom is to keep looking at the table and try to see the table without your projections. If you stop telling the table what it is, what is there? That is to say, we have an interpreted world, a world suffused with our projections, projections which have been so massaged into the <coughs> objects around us that our interpretation seems to be the very nature of the object, but it's not, because other projections should come. That's why it's nice to hang out with kids, because they don't have the same projective patterns as adults. Once we see that, the world becomes softer. It's not full of fixed hard objects, but of moments of interpretation. There's something dynamic and playful about that, which allows us to think, what sort of interpretation shall I bring to bear on this situation? Which clearly takes us in the line of compassion. <coughs> How will I be with this other person in relation to this particular <coughs> realm of possibilities here. The more we loosen our own tight definition of how things are, many, many possibilities are revealed. That's the side of compassion. From the side of wisdom, we want to look who is the experiencer? What is the direct, immediate taste of experience? Our habitual tendency is to turn into language, to narrative. Oh, I know I'm experiencing the table because when I squeeze it, it feels hard. When I hit it, my knuckles hurt. The table is showing me its strength and so on. We can all elaborate some story. That's a story. Who is the experiencer of the table? Who is the experiencer of the story? So, as one thought leads into the next thought, leads into the next thought, stay with the immediate presence of experience itself. The, the formulation of storylines takes us off here, there, and everywhere, endlessly weaving these wonderful accounts, stories about what is going on. That is happening simultaneously with the immediacy of being present with the isness of things, the thusness of things. Eh? Grammar collapses in trying to describe this. But that's the central focus of the meditation practice. And after the break, we come back and we start to do some meditation together. Um, and the, the, the key focus, really, for us is to start to find out about ourselves. Because there's a kind of paradox in this, that you know, Buddhism in many ways is set up as a path to truth. And there are many important books on Buddhism which set out very interesting ideas. These ideas can be useful as tools if you use them. If you wrap yourself in them, they will become very, very harmful. Knowing about Buddhism is not really helpful at all unless you're applying for a job in a university. Apart from that, it's not going to put any food in your mouth. But being a Buddhist also is not necessarily very useful. It gives you a kind of social identity and so on. Our key focus is to see with the eyes of the Buddha, to inhabit the space of open awareness. For each of us, the path to that open awareness will be slightly different. That's why it says in the tradition that the Buddha taught 84,000 dharmas, 84,000 different ways, because each person is different. So, over the course of this time, I will try to use different methods, different images, and so on, that, and some of these will be interesting to some people and not to others. And the main thing is for you to, to try to use whatever is, is offered as a way of resonating into yourself. Each person has to do the practice for themselves. Nobody can do the practice for you. And your own unique configuration means that 
only you can untie the knots in yourself. Because each person's knots are slightly different. There are general rule books on the untying of knots. There are general principles for meditation. But we need to see ourselves how we slip into habits of association, how we build up pictures in our mind. What is the particular slippery slope for us? What's the door that we always seem to go into? <coughs> that will have particular texture and quality, which we can only get a sense of by visiting it again and again. So, a lot of meditation follows uh, Samuel Beckett's advice, fail, fail again, fail better. <laughs> You know, it's not a glorious path to light. It's about having some clarity and getting lost. And then being curious about how you got lost, not analyzing it from a distance as if you're going to give an objective report, not falling into it and beating yourself up or going into self-pity, but just seeing, oh, that's how it operates. That's how it operates. So we want calmness, clarity, and a kind of neutrality of balance. So, <coughs> if we maybe now a little bit more at meditation. In the, usually in a meditation, we know what we have to do in advance. That is to say, we're going to follow the breath, uh, you might be doing a slow walking meditation, you might be doing a visualization or a mantra practice. So there is an organizing thought towards which you are aligning yourself. However, <coughs> in the practice we're going to do just now, the focus of attention is on whatever arises. So. We don't prefigure any particular object or uh, thing to attend to, except whatever arises. So I want to link this back to what we looked at just before the break. The sense that there is a field of experience of which we are part. Therefore, in the practice we begin just sitting and life goes on. Here we are sitting. All we want to do is to attend to the process of what is unfolding. This unfolding sometimes looks on the inside, sometimes looks on the outside, sometimes feels interesting, sometimes not interesting, sometimes feels new, sometimes feels habitual. we attend to the flow of experience. Of course, when, if you look around the room and you think, well, there's the walls, there's the ceiling, there are fixed factors in experience, mm -hmm. therefore, not much is going to change. You have already set up a, a quasi-objective framework within which experience is occurring. Mm -hmm. To be present is to be present with what arises for you. That is, if you like, a passive receptive positioning. It's not an active controlling position. So we began the morning with focusing on the breath. That is active and controlling. I will focus on my breath. And if I, my attention goes off, I will bring it back. There's a sense of individual personal agency and to a certain extent a will to power, there's a making something happen. In order to be present, we have to release our energy from its familiar patterns of intoxication. Now, is that something that we do or not? That's a central question, because if you hear that as I have to keep unlocking these knots. Then again, you say to the ego, a task of busyness. Actually, the unlocking happens naturally. In Tibetan, it's called rangro, self-liberation. It is linked to the fact 
of impermanence. All our experience is changing all the time. Moment by moment, being in this room is changing. On an abstract conceptual level, you can say, well, I recognize this room from maybe yesterday evening or when I first entered it this morning. It's the same room. I was here in the first part, then we had a break, I went outside, I looked around, and now I've come back into the same place. All of that orientation is conceptual. That is to say, I am saying this is the wall, I am saying these are the cupboards, I am the one who is giving order and shape to what is going on. We are so used to doing this, it's so completely automatic for us, that the cost of it, the amount of energy that's involved in constructing the world moment by moment, is kind of factored into our daily experience. We don't know that we're doing it. It just seems to be what we have to do. In order to enter a state of presence, it's releasing these habits of doing. On one level, it's not difficult because they're actually releasing themselves. <coughs> On another level, it is difficult because we go into tightening up in the next moment. So, although naturally a thought arises and passes, a sensation arises and passes, a perception and so on, if we, as it were, bridge across into the next moment and link these, we can build up a picture. So, <coughs> we can all see at least a bit of the wall in this room. We look at it, then we look away, we look back, and we think, oh, it's the same thing. How do we know it's the same thing? Because I remember how it looked before. Is your memory in the wall, or is your memory in your mind? Well, my memory is in my mind. So the proof of the continuity of the wall is in your mind. It's not in the wall. This is very important. The mind is chief. The mind is the main function. The mind includes everything. The mind includes the body. The relation to the body is through the mind. Because we know we have a body. That is to say, by mind here I don't mean a kind of a cognitive processing center. I mean the awareness through which everything is revealed. If you weren't aware, you wouldn't have that revealed to you. When you are sitting and you're listening, then your ear consciousness is dominant. Probably there's not too much taste in your mouth. When, you, when lunchtime comes and you go towards food, then the saliva starts to run and this taste consciousness becomes more alive. The consciousnesses are activated situationally. That is to say, our body is a discontinuous phenomena experientially. Some of the time we don't have hands, some of the time we don't have ears or feet. The body is coming in and out of its formation experientially. Objectively, conceptually, we can give an account of the continuity of our body. We can say, my femur is and the right leg is always where it should be. My vertebrae are aligned in this particular way and I might have trouble with numbers three and four or something. That is a series of concepts. It is difficult for us to recognize just how much of our life is conceptual, is interpreted. It's all very well when you read these books uh, to come across the terms like naked awareness. But well, we are habitually adorning ourselves or wrapping ourselves in these interpretations. So there are two aspects of meditation. One is to just to hold the flavor of terms like openness, presence, <coughs> awareness, which gives us perhaps a sense of relaxed, at ease, available, hospitable. 
And within that, the movement of the mind gives rise to patterns. <coughs> These patterns and the openness of the mind are not two separate sets of phenomena. They are part and parcel of the same integrated field that we live in. However, since habitually our attention has been <coughs> caught up in what is arising and in the stories that we tell about what is arising, the openness itself is not very available. But this openness is the ground of our own being. So, when we meditate, we're not trying to achieve something, but to allow the releasing of phenomena to continue as it has always been going on, and to be present with that, so that our pattern of not releasing, that is to say of grasping and accumulating and building up structures as if they truly existed, can start to dissolve. If these patterns dissolve, you won't be left with nothing at all. <coughs> it's not a kind of nihilistic venture that turns everything into some kind of primordial mud. Rather, these, uh, each aspect is now revealed as a potential. To give an outer example, it would be as if you were playing with children with a Lego set. And with the Lego, you make a car. And the child's playing with the car in the morning. But by the afternoon, they say, what can I play with? You say, play with the car. Uh, I'm bored with the car. Well, that's okay. So we take the pieces of the Lego out, the car vanishes, and now we have this potential to create something else. The same pieces put together in a different way create something differently. As long as the concept of car is there, it's as if these pieces all belong together in that pattern. And that's our familiar habitual association, our notion of how we are, how other people are, how the world is. But it's built up of building blocks. On an outer level, we can name some of the building blocks, like our, we could keep a diary of habitual negative thoughts, for example. You could think about your childhood and understand some of the psychological patterns that come from there. Though the more we look at them, we see that these building blocks are actually not things, they are patterns of energy. And that whatever is constructed is shimmering temporary shapes brought into being by complex fields of experience. We are like that. Everyone we meet is like that. The hills are like that. The cars, the sheep, everything has that same nature. We can experience this directly through the practice. By not continuously investing our habitual structures with our beliefs, with our life energy, they are allowed to have their natural course, which is to say, they appear and they disappear. They appear and they disappear. And they appear according to context. You know, when we have a break, we stand up. We don't have to tell ourselves how to stand up, because it's a break, you stand up. It's part of the world. Our participation in the world calls us forth in ways that we don't need to plan. <laughs> Most of us are much too burdened by planning, because planning is trying to project into the future patterns that are required. What meditation is about is to experience the richness, the um, availability of the phenomenological field, that is to say, of everything which registers, colors, tastes, smells, and so on. And to be part of that, it is our belonging with, our participation that allows us to be in sync with other people. We can have an appropriate conversation with someone, not by wondering what will I say, that's actually going to make the conversation difficult, but just having a sense how their eyes are, 
how close they stand to you, what sort of a conversation is possible? People will show you directly. If do they want a hug, do they want a handshake, do they want just to look? People are revealing themselves, just as we are revealing ourselves to other people. So, the participation in the evolving world as it displays itself means you can come out of your head and into the connection which exists directly with the world. Now, you could call that an embodied connection, you could call it the energy of the chakras moving through, or you could see it as the entire field moving within the domain of awareness, which traditionally in Buddhist language is called the Dharma Dhatu. Dharma Dhatu simply means that the expanse or the open domain within which phenomena come and go. So we can do some of this practice now. We're just sitting as we're sitting. We don't even need to have a particular posture. Uh, but one that's not going to get uh, uh, painful through time is better. So we just sit. There's no particular beginning because we're not entering into something artificial. Experience moves on as before. And we're just moving from being actively engaged in moving our thoughts around to just being present with whatever's occurring. For this, we usually meditate with the eyes open. You can let the gaze rest in the space in front of you. Because if you close your eyes and you go into, as it were, a private world, at the end of the practice, you have to open your eyes and deal with what's there. And that creates um, a kind of slippery point whereby the thought, oh, I'm back in the world again, I'm back in the room, allows the cognition that stabilizes the world as an objective phenomena to jump in and, and label what's going on. Because that's what we're normally doing. So if the eyes are open and the gaze is relaxed in the space, outer phenomena and inner experience can experience these arising together. And so the boundary between inner and outer, personal and impersonal, is just allowed to dissolve because it's an artificial impalant. Any thoughts or questions about this before we begin? Okay, so we just sit for a while. So we'll do this uh, practice quite frequently. Usually we do it for quite a short period of time because the function is not to strive to do something in particular, but in the most open, released, relaxed way just to be present with whatever is occurring. This involves disidentification. You could say it involves renunciation. Just as with the example with the Lego before, <coughs> once the car has been made, if the child then says, this is my car, they might resist their brother wanting them to open up the pieces so that they could make something new together, because it's mine. In the same way, when thoughts, feelings and memories arise in the mind, we can easily adhere to them as being about me or being from me. These thoughts are telling me something about how I am, they're informing me about my own nature, or I am the one who is having these thoughts. From that point of view, they become personal possessions. When they're personal in that way, it is as if we would be doing a violence to ourselves by not being interested in them. 
surely all these thoughts and feelings that we have are saying something important. Surely they must mean something. From a traditional uh, Buddhist point of view, they indicate that we are very good citizens of samsara. <laughs> that as long as you cultivate these wonderful thoughts, your addiction to them will keep you trundling along inside these same familiar patterns. Disidentification means allowing the content of our mind just to be stuff. It's just stuff. It's just a thought, a feeling, a sensation. The glue that binds us into them is the wish for these potentials or these uh, possibly useful temporary transient arisings to be relevant to me. That is to say, they spin around the central factor of the individual ego self and that uh, connection leads to a distortion of their own nature because the ego is itself just a temporary arising. There is no such thing as a fixed permanent ego. If we examine our own individual self, it is constituted moment by moment out of different bits and pieces. The content shifts and changes. The signifier that says it has permanent continuity is simply the naming of I, me, myself. And that naming itself has to be dynamic. That is to say the thought is arising and passing and is then repeated and repeated and repeated. The grammatical structure is the same. I am hungry. I am tired. I am happy. If, so, we have the subject, the verb, and the object. That's a normal structure for English language. The verb changes, and the object changes. The subject remains the same. I. I am this, I am that, I, 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 I. The repetition gives us the sense that there is the continuity of a fixed substance. But it's only through the repetition that that substance is called into being. Mm -hmm. From the Buddhist point of view, that is <coughs> the primary delusion to take something which is actually movement, something which is a temporary manifestation, and take it to be permanent. It doesn't mean that there is no ego, there is no self. That's a very odd notion. It is that the ego is dynamic, compassionate, relational. It's part of our connection with others. Because our, when we say something about ourselves, it's always about ourselves as two aspects. So, I am thirsty. It means there is <coughs> thirst and there is a subject who is having thirst. It's speaking of a duality of a relationship. So in the practice, when we're doing it, again and again, you can support the openness by releasing into the out-breath and allow the flow of experience to continue. And whenever we seem to be stuck in a subject position, just stay gently present with the one who seems to be continuous. So, you're sitting, maybe you're thinking, I don't know what I'm doing, this doesn't make any sense. So you might get a series of thoughts like that. In the identification of these thoughts, and the identification is simply a matter of giving attention. When attention is given to that series of thoughts, they seem redolent in value. They seem to be saying something meaningful without interfering with them or changing them in any way, you just stay with them and see what happens. After a few seconds, they've gone and something else is occurring. 
if you take them seriously in the moment that they arise, then you think, oh my God, what am I doing here? Da, 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 da. Then more thoughts start to come to mind. And we start to see it's the quality of attention paid to the patterns of experience that give rise to the pseudo-continuity of the ego self. The ego is an empty signifier. That is to say, I can say I'm hot, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, I'm happy, I'm traveling, I'm sitting. The reason that I can be applied to each of these things is because I has no content of its own. If you have something which has a, a fairly fixed content, like, say, a mug, we can say the mug I'm using for drinking tea. We could also use it for bailing out a boat. We could use it to attack someone. You could put flowers in it. We can think maybe of a hundred, maybe a thousand things to do. But at a certain point, the shape has a limit and we come to the end of our creativity. Because there is a certain givenness to this shape. And that's the same for all the phenomena in the world. But I has no shape. What shape does it have? It's simply an empty signifier. It can be stuffed full of anything. It's not even a skin like a sausage that you could put different contents into. I, the ego, when you look at it, has no shape or form. <coughs> In that sense, the ego eye and the openness of awareness are part and parcel of the same capacity of noetic being. The difference between them is that in saying I, it's as if a little spiral of energy occurs. It seems to seal itself into a point of reference. We don't actually know what I refers to. We say, well, when I say I, I'm talking about me. That's self-evident. But not particularly helpful, because where is me? Well, me is the bit that I talk about when I'm talking about myself. If I'm talking about you, I say you. If I'm talking about me, I say me. Well, thank you, that's clarified a lot. Now we know where we are. It's very mesmerizing. It's very tempting just to say it's self-evident. I exist. What do I exist as? Me. <laughs> so these become two impenetrable points. And the question is, why are they impenetrable? Why can't we see exactly what is there? Is it because we're dull and stupid and we don't know how to meditate? You can't see what is there because there's nothing there. There is nothing in the eye or the me. That's why they can be filled with all this other stuff. The nature of the individual ego is space. In recognizing that, the individual ego reveals itself as the movement of energy of open awareness. It's not that you have to cut off your ego and get rid of yourself in order to awaken to this open state. What appears as limitation is only an illusion. There, is, there has never been any limit. But in taking I to refer to something individual and personal inside me, some unique private possession, because it is so important to me, I have to hide it. So I hide it in a Zurich bank account. <laughs> I hide it in the dark vaults of unavailability. So in not examining ourselves, we keep it safe. But there's a story of the old Nizam of Hyderabad, who was a very, very wealthy man. And he kept a lot of his uh, wealth in jewels. And he had a fabulous collection of pearls, and he stored the pearls in this uh, very dark mm -hmm. kind of chamber. But pearls apparently need to have some light to keep healthy. 
And by the time they came to open the boxes to see his treasure chest, the pearls had lost a great deal of their value. So in the same way, <coughs> in, in protecting ourselves mm. by affirming the importance of ourselves, the validity of ourselves, that very assertion prevents us from looking to see what it is. Just as on an outer level, if somebody, say, for example, says, I'm depressed. You know, our conventional way is to say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then they say, well, I don't think I can do that because I'm depressed. And we then say, okay, well, if you're depressed, then clearly you can't do it. We don't say, could you tell me about the depression? What's the phenomenology of your depression? Because once you start to inquire into the nature of the depression, it starts to show different nuances. It's revealed as something dynamic and changing. But our tendency, and it often it's a sort of polite tendency, is to take it at face value. If you say it like that, then who am I to interfere with your experience? It must be like that. I accept it. That leads to this state of exchanging unopened presence that we don't really inquire into what it is we're talking about. And this is particularly relevant to the first person singular. Because how can I really inquire into how you are if I'm not able to inquire into how I am? If not inquiring into the nature of myself, if I take for granted that I exist as an entity, when I come to meet you, I'm going to deal with you as if it's obvious that you are an entity. And so the conversation that transacts between us is going to be about piling adjectives and adverbs on top of the givenness of the fact that we exist. Which is why this kind of meditation practice can be quite difficult. Because what we're having to release is our tendency to construct and the construction seems vital for the existence of ourselves because we feel that we exist. But if you really look, you can see that what we call my existence is composed of these two aspects. The ungraspable, indeterminate nature of our subjectivity and the rich fullness of our subjectivity. That is to say, if I say, I am thirsty, I am hungry, clearly there are millions and millions of things I can experience and feel and engage in in the world. That's the richness of my being. What is more difficult to see is the richness of my being is grounded in the fact that I am not a thing. It seems like a kind of paradox, but, but surely if I have access to all of that, that means I have a rich life. But you only have a rich life because you can do all these things, and you can only do all these things because actually you're not accumulating them. Each moment is fresh. It's fresh because the I has no essence to it. It has no substance. So our emptiness and our richness go together. If we weren't empty, we would fill up. And we probably all have this experience when we get stressed out, when we've had enough, when we can't cope. What's the quality of that? I can't cope because there is a feeling that I don't like to have. And this feeling is telling me I don't need any more. So in that moment, my sense of being an individual is one of restricted dimension, restricted capacity. Energetically, that feels right, but still the question has to be, who is the one who feels they can't cope? I am. Are you not listening to me? Can't you hear it? I've had enough. Just back off. Leave me alone. I need some space. But... The individual self is nothing but space. So what am I filled with? I'm filled with not me. I'm 
I'm still thinking about what happened this morning. Where has that gone? Where is the morning? The morning has vanished. I'm still thinking about it. <clears throat> I am filling myself up with the echo of something that has gone. I'm thinking about having to visit the tax man and there are going to be these questions and I'm going to have to deal with that or I'm going to go into work and da da da. I'm filling myself up with stuff, with concepts. Who is taking the concepts as real and important? I am. Who are you? What is the nature of the self at that moment? You seem very troubled this week. Life seemed better last week. Yeah, then it was easy. Now it's bad. Oh, I'm sorry that it's bad now. So we somehow accept that things will change, but we don't quite get the fact that if it's sometimes bad and sometimes good, it's neither good nor bad. So how can I be having a bad time and then I'm having a good time? Sometimes if a really bad thing happens in our life and then we have a moment where we feel better, we think, oh shit, I shouldn't be feeling better because I'm really having a bad time. <laughs> this is not right. Bad times should really be what I've got. But the fact is, because the self is empty, because there is no structure to it, no real form or shape, it offers hospitality. So the, from the Buddhist point of view, this is the, the, exactly the key point between samsara and nirvana, between, <coughs> excuse me, between limited existence and open being. That <coughs> if life is what is happening, then I cannot be in charge. But if I feel that being in charge is the only way to guarantee my safety, that is to say, if I am the protector of myself, then I've got to be on the job 24 hours a day, making sure that everything is all right. Everything is all right means the way I want it to be. But how many people get 24 hours when everything goes the way they want? It's actually an impossible task. Actually, we are resilient and responsive. We are flexible. We are much more like seaweed moving in the waves than a, a bar of steel. But somehow we've got caught in imagining that we should be reliable, predictable, in charge of what's going on, able to give a clear account of what we want. This is a, a terrible violence, is to have an organism which is part of the experiential field <laughs> acting as if it is a piece of metal. So that our vitality, our shared life, which is shared with the environment and is therefore moving and changing with everything in the environment, is attacked by our own belief that we should act as if we were a thing, that we should be in charge. So. To be open is to allow life to happen. Now, if your fear is, if I'm not in control, it will be out of control, it becomes very difficult to find the middle way. Because as, as soon as you start to relinquish a bit of control, start saying, oh my God, it's, it's going to get lost. What will happen? Well, what will happen is life will go on. Yeah, but it won't be on my terms. Maybe I won't like it. Well, have you always liked everything in your life? Are you dead? No. Oh, well. <laughs> it's not so serious that every now and then you get a dose of shit in front of you. It's not all that pleasant, but you get through it. It's not a limit. But the, the ego, when it's misconstrued, misexperienced as something definite, is very concerned with limits. That we define ourselves in terms of what we can tolerate and what we can't tolerate. As we get older, we find we have to tolerate a lot of things we never thought we would. How do we do that? By relaxing the self-construct, <clears throat> which is exactly the function of the meditation practice. <clears throat> Whenever we get into a position 
we're, we're adhering to particular patterns of thoughts or feelings of sensation. Long, slow out breath, and just stay present with what's there. When a thought arises in, in the form of I feel or I like or I don't like, stay present with the one who is experiencing the thought. What does I refer to? Is there a particular shape or color or substance that is the reliable center point or core position of that I? Or is I actually a manifestation? Is it something which shows itself and therefore has, if you like, an undeniable existence, but it shows itself briefly? So there is a facticity, an impact, and yet no endurance. It passes by. So in the practice, stay as close as possible in the moment, in this present moment, with whatever is occurring. Whatever is occurring is always in the now. We don't have to find the present moment. The present moment is all we ever have. Memories happen now. Planning for Monday morning happens now. You cannot move out of the present. The present, which is linked to the past and the future, is also the infinite present. Just as the ego that's worried about its financial status is linked directly to open awareness. So it's not that we have to go from samsara into nirvana across some great state shift from one thing to another. It's that by looking at what is actually there, not projecting onto it, not making assumptions about it, not interpreting it, just looking and seeing who am I, what is this experience, we are revealed to ourselves as otherwise than what we thought we were. We are not who we think we are. Who we think we are is a movement of the energy of the mind. The mind itself is not a thought. It can't be ca captured by a thought. It can't be defined by a thought. So here we again see we are open, ungraspable, and the ceaseless flow of experience simultaneously. It's not that you choose one or the other. When the ground of being, when this natural openness is not present for us, we seek to stabilize the flow of experience, to concretize it, and that's when statements like I'm thirsty or I'm tired are given an extra energetic oomph because we are making a proposition, we are showing that we really are here, and then it's gone, and then it's gone. The more the ground of our being, the openness, the natural presence is available, then each movement, each statement, I'm tired, I'm thirsty, I want to go for a walk, is simply arising as the energy and then going back. In the traditional example, like a wave arising in the ocean, it goes back into the ocean. It doesn't mean that there isn't a wave, but the wave is inseparable from the ocean. When you, if you're in a small dinghy and you've got a stormy day, you're so concerned with the waves, you don't really have a sense of the calm, deep ocean. The key thing is not staying in the frothy excitement or trying to control the waves. Nobody can do that. But allowing the waves to move by not resisting them, not standing apart and judging them, not abandoning oneself into them, just being present with the movement of the mind. And in that state, natural presence is revealed. So this is the central approach to the meditation. Maybe we should try it again. <coughs> oh. <coughs> can begin <coughs> just relaxing into a long, slow out-breath. Here we are. Who is the one who is experiencing it? Just stay present with that. <laughs> Thank you.
suppose, Ian, there are any comments you want to make from that, or any questions you want to raise? Mm -hmm. I'm just aware all the time of this commentary that's going on at the back of my head, so that while I'm noticing, I'm noticing that I'm noticing, and then I'm noticing that I'm noticing that I'm noticing. So, and then there's the this isn't how it should be, I'm not doing this, so then the judgment a bit comes in, and then there's the notice it is that now I'll be judging. So it's like words all the time that go that get in the way of particular oh does that get in the way? This, I guess it's almost is this right? Is this how it should be? <laughs> well, then, and if it's not, how the hell do I get rid of this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think for, for all of us, there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. The, the question, I suppose, is it's a matter of crowd control. <laughs> <laughs> the Metropolitan Police have been developing kettling, and that's often what we try to do, you know, try to get all these thoughts and compress them into one place and keep them going. But actually it's much better to offer an open space. You know, it's just stuff. Yeah. And, and the real glue is when we feel it's got something to do with us. So most people have the experience of having a critical internal voice, the kind of judge that, that kind of mm. runs across what we do and shrinks us down and, and tries to correct things. That's something which arises, does its piece, and then goes. So it's like kind of loose shunting. One, one wagon bumps into the next, and it goes on and on and on. So the thoughts are carrying this kind of energetic movement across. If you just let it pass through, it just, a, a bit of turbulence, and then it's gone. The glue is when we think that the, what the judge is saying is got something to do with us. Now, who is the us in that moment is another thought. Because the mind itself as awareness cannot be caught, but the ego as a patterning of manifestation is very vulnerable. Because if you make something, is it have I made it the right way? You know, if you, if you go out and you walk around and you see the trees growing, there's many, many different kinds of trees. But even if you looked at all the oak trees or the beech trees, each oak is different from another oak. We don't say this is a better oak tree than that oak tree. It would be impossible to say that. We just say a lot of different kinds of oak trees, a lot of different ways to be an oak tree. But the ego is exactly as you were saying at the end, gets concerned about, am I getting it right? As if there was a right way. That is a, a very artificial way that we deal with ourselves, by cre creating an ideal structure and then blaming ourselves because we don't align ourselves with something which is actually not to be found in nature. In nature, everything's a bit weird and distorted. Just look at potatoes. <laughs> so... In your potato ness, you know, in it, <laughs> 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 of how you are. <laughs> the potatoes come up with little eyes on them, and, and we say, you know, we should accept each other, warts and all. So that's at the heart of it, isn't it? That how come I have limited hospitality to myself? How come I can't accept myself, warts and all? So the gate is narrow. Many are called, but few can enter. Why is that? Why, why isn't it a broad gate? What is the inhibition about accepting ourselves as we are, including the judge? Mm -hmm. Because the judge is just another temporary formation. Mm -hmm. But if you give a lot of status to the judge and put them up on a pedestal, <laughs> and you give a lot of status to your vulnerability and put it low down, then the judge is going to be kind of attacking your vulnerability. But these are just temporary moments arising and passing. So the question always comes back to, 
what is my refuge? What is the ground that I'm standing on? What can I rely on? The contents of my mind are ever shifting. No? So they're not reliable. <coughs> and yet I'm trying to make them reliable. I'm imagining that the judge is telling me the reliable truth about myself. And if I was to do what the judge says, he'd get off my back. That's not true. Because the judge only does judging. The judge won't do anything else. The judge is not going to say, oh, sweetie, you've suffered enough. Welcome aboard. I see now that I misunderstood you. Judges don't do that. They just say, no, not quite good enough. Try harder. So the judging voice in the head is always going to play the same tune. Mm. If we accept, that's what that tune is like. This is a radio. It's not my own CD player. I'm not picking the tunes. If I turn on the radio, that station plays a medley of tunes. Some I like, some I don't like. Now this song is coming on that I don't like. It's just a song. I don't like it. It's just a song. I don't like it. And that's the fulcrum point, isn't it? Because if we tip into I don't like it, then it says if something <coughs> like this happening. So I have to do something different, switch the radio off. Because some fundamental horror is being enacted because this thought is in my head. It's just another bit of crap. That's all. Passing through. Just some stuff. So it's the glue of our identification. Because in the moment that we identify this arising, we become limited by it. As soon as I say, I don't like this, I've given that arising power over me. No? I mean, that's when, you know, in, the, in these um, military prisons in, in Iraq, when they were wanting to torture people, you would play them kind of bad rock and roll. <laughs> Not many people want to listen to bad rock and roll. <laughs> Not Iraqi men in their 40s. So you give speak something to someone that they don't like, and then you're working with that, that and take, <coughs> take this away. It's horrible. I can't bear it. That's how you can really put the squeeze on someone. So, so the question for us is, can we welcome what happens? What will happen to me if I allow a painful thought to arise in my mind? What will it do? It's really to think, what is, what sort of teeth, what sort of blades, what sort of guns and tanks do these thoughts actually have? What real damage do they do? And if you can stay with them, you find actually they're not so dangerous. Once they come, then you go. <laughs> but if you get caught by that, then you go into the reaction. Oh, I don't want to have that again. That was terrible. What was it? <laughs> so then you have the story about, I can't bear that. Oh, that, that's really horrible. But we didn't stay with it long enough to see what happened. It just popped in and popped out. So that's the whole thing about relaxing into the out breath. Offering hospitality. Because presence is inseparable from hospitality. Presence is non-selective. But our narrow configuration of our sense of who we are is very selective. So these thoughts that you're describing, these patterns, they're very, very common. It's something we all will experience. And they're about the maintenance of how we are. So the meta-commentary. You have a thought, then you comment on the thought is a kind of linking together of the continuity of ourselves <coughs> as somebody who knows what's what. It's a voice in our head that says, I know that. And you can see in the small children when they're growing up, once they're, you know, especially five, six, seven, they really get into knowing things because they're trying to stabilize themselves in a world where big people know an awful lot. <laughs> is constantly trying to assert things. Things about 
it's boys about motor cars and guns and so on, that girls get other things that they get into, but wanted to have a lot of information. So that's a, a very old voice in our head, isn't it? I know the answer. I am the one who decides what something is. So it's shaping. It's not allowing the shapelessness of the moment. And it's just a thought. So the question then is, how do you move out of the identification with the thought? When we begin the practice and we release the outbreak, that's like sending a message to the local post office. I have changed my address. So when these thoughts arrive, all we're doing is saying, not at this address, not at this address. <laughs> thoughts come there, the postman's got it in hand, not for me. But if we're very interested, we want to open it up and see what says. What good news has the judge ever brought you? No? Judge is never going to bring good news. These negative voices in our head are just one of the many bad tunes that run through the, the universe. They, if you take them as definitive of yourself, you will be limited. I mean, in this last century, we had a lot of consciousness raising around feminism, <coughs> around race relations, and so on. And it was very common at the beginning of the 20th century for people to be able to say, without any shame or embarrassment, highly definitive statements about what women were, about what black people were, about what homosexuals were. And it was seen as absolutely normal that you could know what somebody was just because of the group they belonged to. And due to the consciousness-raising struggles that have gone on, what we now have much more sense of the particular nature of people. That just because somebody has a particular colour or shape or sexual orientation, you can't presume anything about them. So we're brought back from stereotyping to phenomenological precision. You have to have the experience before you can know anything. But if the knowledge is put there before the experience, you have a violence. Yeah? And so when you have these critical voices in your head, that's what we're experiencing, a knowledge before the fact that's laying down the line and that hides the, the, the freshness of experience. Because you have to encounter things to know what they are. But if we frighten ourselves, it's then very difficult to stay with it long enough to allow what's occurring to reveal itself. So we relax into the outbreath and just allow the mind to arise as it does. And stay with it, not falling into what's occurring, not trying defensively to step back from it, but just letting everything show itself, whether it's a pain in the body, a noise outside, a particular thought, mm. a whole series of thoughts that link together. Just stay with them. See what happens. Is there any purpose to a thought? Like if you have a recurring thought that you think, for me, I was in the room meditating and then I was arguing with my sister and then I was back in the room and I was trying to resolve this, this thing, this problem I've got with my sister. So I was kind of constantly doing that. And there seems to be a very strong pull to be out of this room, in a sense, resolving mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a problem with your sister, you probably can't resolve it thinking on your own. So, you know, does a thought have a purpose? No. Mm -hmm. A thought can have a function. I mean, a purpose, in a sense, is a function which is embedded in something so that it can't be used for anything else. Mm -hmm. So the function, you now on the walls were bed pan, pans hanging. So these would be used in the old days for heating a bed. Mm -hmm. That's their function. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of making them was, uh, at that time, people uh, didn't have much heating in their houses, and so having a warm bed was a good thing. Mm -hmm. But a thought doesn't have a purpose in that sense. You, if you give the thought about the trouble with your sister a significance, <laughs> then thinking about it seems meaningful to you, and you can develop a purpose, I need to do this, I need to do that. But you're picking it up and using it in, in, a, in a particular way. 
thoughts themselves will have any purpose. But uh, wasn't, wasn't I picking it up in order to find a resolution? Yeah. So that... And, and have you found a resolution? No, but I think what I'm trying to do is not phone up and tell her what I really think of her, but try and sort of not be too reactive and kind of find a, a, se a sensitive way around saying what I want to say. So it kept coming up, how well, I was going to do this, how I was going to do this. Knowing your sister, you can know that giving her an earful probably doesn't work. No. So then there's not all that much to think mm. about. All you need to do is remember your sister. That's the thing is we go into our minds to try to solve problems that if we stayed in the world looking out in front of our own nose and seeing who the other person is, the answer is in their face. Should I say this or not? Look at their face. What are they telling you? <laughs> Shall we go and have lunch? How this dimension is, nobody can really describe. Although, according to the Tibetan tradition, there are many images and metaphors that are used to give some sense of it, essentially it's beyond description. Therefore, the, the issue is not <coughs> whether I, as a teacher, can describe it to you. We can start on the basis that that's impossible. The question is <coughs> whether I can, <coughs> me, <coughs> in some way, help you to hear because the key thing is about hearing yourself, how to listen to yourself, how to observe yourself, how to get the flavor of yourself. And as I was indicating earlier, this is a more passive, uh, receptive activity. Mm -hmm. If you look in the manner of a policeman, you won't see it. If you listen with an agenda as if you're trying to find something, you won't get it. Why is that? Because it's not something in particular. Christmas is coming. And in the Christian tradition, they always tell the story of the three wise men out guarding their flocks and they see this special star and they follow the star and they come to this uh, unpromising context, a little barn and in it they find this special child. Very often people have this hope that they're going to meet some special person in their life or some special teaching or find something special in themselves, some special revelation. Of, but special stands in relation to ordinary. We only know that it's ordinary because we can say it's not special. We only know that it's special because we can say it's not ordinary. So we're still in the realm of comparing and contrasting. <coughs> but the mind itself, in not being a thing, cannot be compared to anything else. We can't say it's better than this or worse than this. It's not a thing. This is so difficult to get a sense of. And as long as we keep looking for something which is a thing, something we can get a handle on, <coughs> develop a narrative about, we're going to be on a search to nowhere. You can spend years and years and years looking for that special experience. Some people on spiritual paths are persecuted by having had an early breakthrough. They had a moment that was completely calm and peaceful, infinite extension, and then spend years and years trying to get that same experience back. Experiences will always come and go. An experience, <clears throat> because it is of its nature transient, cannot be the answer. Obviously it can't be, it's just ephemeral. So, we're trying to see something that doesn't move. We're trying to hear something that doesn't make a sound. We're trying to smell something that has no aroma to it. How do we do this? By observing again and again how our attention is hooked by having a particular agenda. Our subtle habits of activating maps maybe from our family constellation, maybe from our general education, maybe from some kind of spiritual education, 
are maps that indicate the shape and form and location of this special thing that we're looking for. Renouncing special is very important. Special, I remember when I was in Calcutta once with my teacher, <clears throat> and we went into a, a little cafe, and the waiter said, do you want special coffee? And he was saying, we'll have special coffee, but he said to me, you will never have a special mind. <laughs> So some things can be special, and some things are not. <laughs> and of course, in, in the Tibetan teachings in particular, there are endless levels of tantric initiation and new higher levels, this, that, and the other. You can spend a lot of time on a treadmill trying to approach this final point where someone will give you something. But nobody can give you anything of value. People can give you money, they can give you a kiss, they can give you a dinner. But these will all again be fleeting experiences. Your own nature is already there. If it wasn't there, how could it be your nature? It would have to be some temporary situation. <coughs> so how to clearly see ourselves involves not looking for something. That's not looking for something in the sense of not going on a search for something, but even when an experience is arising, how to be with it without catching it inside the habitual formations of our interpretation. So as a general <coughs> way of getting a sense of this, I would invite you to look around the room and just let your eye fall on something. It could be the wall, painting, whatever it would be, the back of someone's head. And when you've focused your attention on something, allow yourself in, inside your head to describe what you're seeing. Inside your head, say as many things as you can about what you're seeing, so that you can define it as precisely as possible. In that process, <coughs> you are telling the object what you know about it or what you imagine about it. Now look at the same object and relax into the out breath and just gazing at the object, see what it is telling you. How does it show itself to you?
does it feel as if there's a difference between these two modes? <clears throat> if we allow the object to reveal itself, it is as far as possible on the object's own terms. It tends to be simpler. When we are telling the object what it is, we are writing it in our familiar narratives. We are placing it inside the pigeonholes in our mind, giving to it the usual affective interpretation, the likes, not likes, and so on. But what is this object if we stop telling it what it is? Surely it's something pretty weird. Just color. Does it have any purpose or meaning? Just stuff. This is a very simple exercise and you can do it again and again when we have a break, you can go outside and look at a plant for example and see what you think of it, how you locate it, values you give to it and then allow it to show itself. You can chew some of its leaves or lick them, you can smell it, you can do the same with the earth, you can get the feel of it. What is this stuff? We are forever telling the world what it is. And therefore the world becomes a reflection of ourselves. And of course since we are in our ordinary being rather limited, we limit the world. We include it inside our frame of reference. By allowing the world to show itself as it is, we find there's not so many things to hang on to. Because <clears throat> when we are telling the world what it is, <clears throat> first of all we name the object, which is like screwing a little handle onto it. Then we grab the handle, now we've got the object, and then we can tell more stories about it. When the object is just revealing itself, what is there to hold on to? If you go out in a field and you look at a sheep, Unbelievable. What is this strange thing? In my misspent youth, I remember being in Edinburgh on Arthur's seat in the middle of the night, having taken a large dose of LSD, <laughs> and looking into the eyes of a sheep. One of the strangest experiences in my life. <laughs> I'm sure it was also a very strange experience for the sheep. <laughs> we locked eyes like that for of course, on LSD, you have no idea how long it takes, but it seemed like a very, very long period of time. <laughs> and this, the, the absolute otherness of the world of the sheep was so amazing. And all the things that one might know to, to locate that as an animal, and it's like this, and it does that, and just vanished. And suddenly, the edge of the world appears. It's completely ungraspable. You can't leap into the future because it's without any handles. Now, in a probably safer way, in terms of health and safety, <laughs> we use meditation rather than LSD, <laughs> but you can achieve a similar result <coughs> by starting to observe <coughs> the projective nature of human understanding. Because Projection, in that sense, stops strangeness. It stops otherness. Otherness provides an immediate limit to the hegemony of my self-esteem. So, that is to say, <clears throat> in order to feel good about myself, if I want a kind of mastery about events, then I want to be able to know what everything is. If I'm stopped in my tracks, if I have a real curiosity and surprise, then I'm faced with the unknowability of many things. The more that's unknowable, the more the power of my uh, interpretive powers becomes limited. That has two 
as possibilities. One is, I feel endangered and outraged. Secondly, I could be surprised and open and with that freedom of movement get a new kind of experience. In the past, when European nations started to move out into the world in their little ships and arrived in other countries, they found people living there. They found it very difficult to be interested in how these people were. The people on these ships were not anthropologists. They were not curious about the human condition. They were greedy for power and gold and proselytizing their religion and so on. And so they tended to see the inhabitants of these countries as a means to an end. To be enslaved, to be murdered, to be turned into uh, useful uh, aids to producing value. That is to say, the otherness, the radical difference of the cultures they were encountering didn't make any real impact on these people. When we look back now, we see what a terrible tragedy that is. On a daily basis now, languages are vanishing from this world. Certainly dialects are vanishing very, very fast as you get standardized pronunciation in more and more countries. Differences between people that show the nuances, the infinite possibilities of creativity are being collapsed into standardized production. There are lots of dangers of that, <coughs> but one particular danger is we, can, we start to assume that we know everything. Nowadays you can get <coughs> guides to every country in the world, in every aspect, and you can arrive in a country you've never been to and have a sense that you know what the best restaurant is and you know what bus you have to take to get to your hotel. You don't need to speak to anyone who belongs in that country. You can pass through it. Now, when I was a child and used to go to the shops with my mother, she would always be blethering away with the people behind the shop and I would become very, very bored. <laughs> but it was an absolute necessity in Scotland to have at least 20 or maybe 100 words with the person who was giving you butter or potatoes. It was just necessary. Why? Because you were buying something from someone. Then we got supermarkets, and you could go into the supermarket and come out of the supermarket without speaking to anyone. It was much more efficient. Now you can travel to a foreign country and do whatever you want without speaking to a native. <coughs> you can go for a holiday in Kenya and you go into a place where you don't need to know anything about the culture and you will have the same kind of food that you would have in London or New York. This is a kind of madness. This is a kind of rolling a carpet out over the world so that I get more of the same wherever I am. And from, from the point of view of meditation, we can see how, how harmful this can be because it means there is then nothing to challenge the ego's sense of total mastery. If I can have what I like, wherever I like, whenever I like, there is nothing to say, hang on a minute, what are you up to? Who do you think you are? Why, why, why are you so convinced, so wrapped inside this particular vision of the world that you think it's okay to both impose it on other people and use it as a basis for ignoring other people? So, the loss of difference is very, very challenging. Now, if you take that back into sitting in meditation, weird stuff arises in our mind. This is very helpful. When you meditate, it's like going to a country where you don't know the language. When you're having a cup of tea and chatting with someone, you know what to do. When you sit in the practice, it's another country. What will I do? Oh. I'll do what I know how to do. And then, of course, the other thoughts that arise in your mind seem to be putting you off the path that you're determined to follow. So, <clears throat> if we want to just listen to what is occurring in our head, to just see it, smell it, taste it, in the simplest way so that it shows itself, 
that involves not having an agenda. And the most fundamental agenda we can have is to ensure the continuity of ourselves as we know ourselves to be. That's the agenda of the maintenance of the ego imago, the image that we have of ourselves under all circumstances. Because it requires selective attention highlighting the things that confirm our sense of who we are, rejecting, neglecting the things that disconfirm who we think we are. If we're going to have an open presence, an open panoramic awareness, it means we have to offer hospitality to that which is other than ourselves. But how will I know how to behave? The other will show you. Again, it comes back to the central question. If we're using knowledge as a defense against anxiety, then we want knowledge to precede experience. If we can allow that anxiety is part of our existence, not the determinant of it, but just something you can put your arm around and include as part of experience, then experience can precede knowledge. That knowledge is an outcome of experience, which can be put on the shelf and made use of if necessary. But it can't be the entry point into the world because it will always seek to create more of the same. So this would indicate, of course, <clears throat> that when we are sitting in the practice, we don't know what's going on. Sometimes you think, you can feel, I don't know what meditation is. If you read for example, in the book of uh, texts I translated, Simply Being, you have very traditional uh, accounts from Tibetan great meditators to say, sometimes we feel we don't know what is going on in the practice. Sometimes we feel lost and confused and depressed. Never mind, just stay with the one who is lost and confused. Sometimes we feel angry and frustrated because we don't make any progress in the practice. Don't worry about that. Just stay precisely present with this aspect that feels it's angry and frustrated. Two points in that. One is, great meditators have been doing it for a long time, also don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's very important to know. And secondly, there is no magical solution that can come in and solve this as a problem because it's only a problem when you separate from it and say it shouldn't be happening. The way to deal with confusion in meditation is to return your presence exactly to the site of the confusion. Whether you feel bored or sleepy or disinterested, or excited, or feel you've had a, a magical breakthrough, whatever it is, don't stand in relation to it, don't elaborate the story about it, but simply rest present with whatever is arising. Whatever is arising will pass. The presence remains. Presence doesn't shift. At first, when we're, when we're doing this as a practice, it's as if we're importing presence. We're, we're taking it in as some helpful agent, as if it's a tool. But actually, presence is the pervasive ground structure or the bed of all our experience. It is not transitory. <coughs> the moments of confusion are transitory. However, on a day like this, when we look out and we see these pervasive grey sky, it's difficult to remember that the sky is actually blue. However, after some time, the wind will blow the clouds away and the blue <coughs> sky will again be revealed. If you come to the conclusion that the sky is always grey, you might decide, I can't bear it anymore. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'll draw the curtains, put on the telly, and open a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> because life is unbearable. 
half an hour later, you're kind of drunk, you're in the middle of some stupid movie, the wind's blown, the clouds have gone, the sky is shining, but the curtains are drawn and you don't know. This is the danger. You come to a conclusion about something and then you build up your response on that conclusion and you don't check it out. You don't check it out. Being present means always to be there where the action is. You're always seeing what is new and fresh because you're not anywhere else. Then there's a very interesting question. Well, if I'm not present, where am I? Because if there's this natural condition or awareness or whatever the hell you call it, if I've not got it, where am I? How come I didn't get any? What's wrong with me? Equal opportunities. Hmm? So where do we go if we're not here? Because we're here when we go somewhere else. There's a real paradox in that. We haven't gone anywhere. But we are absorbed in a level that stops us being there. Maybe when you were a child, you practiced sticking out your arms and spinning round and round and round till you fell over. And then when you fall down, you get very dizzy. <laughs> We used to do a thing, breathing in and out, breathing in and out, touching our toes very quick, and then you got a friend to punch you really hard in the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see all these stars. Up in Scotland, we didn't have very much culture. <laughs> We didn't have colour TV, all we had was violence. <laughs> but it's amazing that you, you make yourself dizzy. <laughs> but that's what we do all the time. We live our lives in states of dizziness. We're, we're spinning around with thoughts and feelings and worries and concerns. And then when you stop, Ooh, you feel a bit wheezy, so you think, oh, I better start spinning again. <laughs> Actually, being at rest is quite rare. That's really the issue, that we are hidden from ourselves by our own mind. That is how it is. What is this confusion in your mind? It's thoughts. Where do thoughts come from? They come from your mind. What is the nature of the mind? Infinite. The finite comes from the infinite. Why don't you see the infinite? Because you're caught up in the finite. But the finite and the infinite are not two oppositional things. The finite is the fruit or the display or the flower of the infinite. So in the very moment when you are bedazzled, bewitched, enthralled, mesmerized, intrigued by what's going on, you are exactly where you've always been, in the state of awareness. Because awareness is like an open stage. And on the stage, the drama of subject and object and the interactions is always being played out. When you go to the theatre, you see the actors. Usually, you don't see the stage. If you train in theatre design or you're interested in amateur dramatics, you might be looking at the nature of the stage and the props. But most of the time, we get caught up by the drama. So the emptiness of the stage becomes invisible. But without the emptiness of the stage, we wouldn't have the drama. You need to have the emptiness to allow the actors to move. In the same way, when the thoughts, feelings, and internal conversations are going on, and our external interactions with the world are going on, we are intrigued. We are caught up in this. Oh, it's so fascinating. Where is it occurring? Inside the openness of the mind. Without the open, empty nature of the mind itself, drama after drama after drama couldn't be staged. But the emptiness of the stage is hidden by the intensity of our involvement in the drama. Who are we in terms of the drama? We are the energy of the open stage. So, <clears throat> when you get into meditation, 
and you feel that you're so caught up in your thoughts and you don't know what's going on and you don't know what, what to do with it, don't go anywhere else. Don't apply any antidote. Simply be present with whatever is occurring. If you apply an antidote, you create a triangulation. Me, my problem, and the solution. But the solution is being imported from somewhere else. Somebody has said, oh, do some mantra, or pray with faith, or do this, or do that. So now, I have my problem, and if I apply the solution, it will help. By doing that, you create something artificial. You are already artificial. So you're using a double artifice to return you to the natural state. That doesn't make much sense. Without making any effort, just attend, be present with whatever is occurring. You will find that you're always exactly where you are. We are never out of time. Nobody can go into the past. Nobody can go into the future. Time travel is a fantasy. You cannot go into the past. In psychotherapy, when you get patients in regression, it is as if they are now four years old. And sometimes in, in deeply regressed states, patients will talk in, with the voice of a four-year-old, they will maybe walk and move and so on, as if they were that. But they are not that. That is a drama being staged in the present moment. The only place we ever live is in the present moment. It's impossible to go into the future. If somebody could go into the future, they could find out the numbers of the national lottery. <laughs> they could find out who's going to win the horse race. They could find out which football team is going to win the cup. We could put on our money and we would win money. Nobody is able to do that. For sure, if we are such greedy human beings if there was a way of predicting the future, somebody would be making a lot of dosh out of it. Nobody knows. Why is it they don't know the future? Because the future hasn't arrived. It's not a thing you can go into. The past is not a thing somewhere else. There's no way to go. There's no bus or train or plane that will take you into the past or the future. That's fairly obvious if you think about it. So, when you're in the meditation practice and you go off in a thought, the thought is a thought in the present. It is as if the thought is about the past or the future. It is as if, in sitting inside that thought, being wrapped up in it, you have gone into the past or into the future. But the past and future don't exist. They are concepts. When are we in touch with concepts? In the present. You know, in the big market houses in London, they have endless computer modeling for the future, you know, predicting what will happen if the euro does this or the euro does that. And people are all the time trying to work out whether they should put money going up or down and they cover the best. This is very, 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 very complicated mathematical modeling. It doesn't tell the truth. Some of these big houses lose a lot of money. They make money year after year after year, then suddenly they get it wrong and they lose a lot because it can't be known. So, if you follow the, the logic of this, it's quite a straightforward logic. And you can clarify many problems for yourself by seeing, I am always in the present. I have nowhere else to be, but I keep imagining I'm somewhere else. The imagination is the creativity of the mind. When we imagine we are someplace where we are not, we are both there and not there. So we could be, we could just imagine just now that we are all at home. <coughs> you go into the kitchen and you open the fridge. You've got a sense of what you might find there. For some people it will be a beautiful cheese, for some people it will be some mold. <laughs> Depending on your household skills. You can imagine that. 
You can imagine going to work, opening the door, climbing the stairs, whatever it is, going into the room where you work. That's the office you'll be in on Monday morning. Where is it? It's in your mind. Your mind is creating this image, this imagination, but the imagination is here. You can't go anywhere else. You can imagine being in London or America or wherever. It, it is as if you go there, but you're here. Now, what we tend to do is be so captivated by this delicious brilliance of our own mind, our imagination, that we take our imagination to be real and think we have actually gone to these places. But of course we haven't. <coughs> we are always just here. So where are we? We can't find it. Why? Because we're addicted to our imagination. The imagination is as if. But what is? Well, I can't see what is because of as if. <laughs> well, why don't you give up as if and then you'll see what is? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but um, it's as if you're asking me to do something I don't want to do. <laughs> why don't you want to do it? Well, because I'm like this. But I thought it was as if. Yeah, it's as if I'm like this. <laughs> but because it is as if I'm like this, and I have been like this for a long time, if I was to stop being the as if what I think I am, and just see what I actually am, I wouldn't know who I was, because it's as if I am what I am. And in that way, you see how, how absolutely gorgeous it is to tell stories. You know, if, you, if you're hanging out with a four-year-old, they're kind of biting your ear all day long. We've just got stories and stories and stories and stories. We are full of words. And if we take these words to be representing reality, we become very confused. The words are the imagination. This is the creativity of our mind. It is as if. This is the dreamlike realm. That's why in this... Eastern traditions, whether it's Advaita Vedanta or Buddhist schools, all the same. The world is like a dream. It's an illusion. It's like the reflection of the moon on water. It is as if. It, when you see a mirage on a hot summer's day, you see water. There is no water there. But it is as if there is water. When we imagine the future, it is as if we are thinking of the future. We are now, we're having a thought. Now, it's now's thought. The content of it, it is as if it's about the future. Same with the past. All we have is now. What is the now of now? What does it mean to be here now? Who is the one who is here now? That's what we're looking for when we talk about presence and awareness. And the only thing that stands, as it were, between me and my own presence is my own creativity. And that cre creativity includes the notion that there is a me who is separated from my presence. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. So if you start with a dualistic assumption, I have to get enlightened. There's enlightenment over there, or the natural state over there. And in between, there's all this crud, all these deposits of old shit. So I've got my scrubbing brush out, and I'm doing dodgy sempa practice, and I'm purifying myself, <laughs> because I want to get to enlightenment. Enlightenment in that state is an, imaginal, an imagination. I, the dirty bugger, who has to do a lot of purification, <laughs> that's the imagination. And all the crap, that's the imagination as well. The natural state is already there, hidden by your own shining nature. That's not what it normally feels like, because we are addicted <coughs> to these forms. There's a Christian hymn that says, 
immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. That's exactly about this point of view. Except we would say, <coughs> immortal, invisible, mind only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. This is to say, the mind is not an object you can see, it is your own self. So, it's not about getting knowledge about your natural state, but about being what you are by stopping pretending to be something else. So, we can do a little bit more practice. We can, if you just, if you're looking into the space in front of you, maybe two arms length, you can imagine a, a ball of rainbow colored light uh, shimmering like a sort of bubble that children blow with washing up liquid. And inside it, we imagine a white letter A. You can do it in the Tibetan shape or just a capital R. This uh, sound of R represents uh, the basis of all creativity and potential. In both the Sanskrit and Tibetan alphabets, it's the root vowel. All the other, all the consonants basically take that vowel and have the other vowels as variations on it. So, R uh, is the, the root of all sounds. It's what the sound that babies make, and they say mama, papa at first, where these plosives are just slight modifications of R. Uh. <coughs> So, out of this sound of R, all words form, and with all words, the creation of all the phenomena in the world. So, when we make the sound R, we can imagine all this diverse identification just collapsing back into the simplicity of the sound, and then the sound goes into silence. And then we sit in the silence, and this ball of rainbow light with the letter R represents the uh, awareness of all the Buddhas. And our, as we make the sound of R, our heart unifies with this letter R, and we just enter into the same state as the mind of all the Buddhas. So it's a kind of symbolic support for doing what we were doing earlier. To make the sound of R three times, just in a long, slow, open way, with the gaze gently resting in space. And then, when we finish doing that, we just sit open, being present with whatever is coming and going. give a brief review of the main things we've covered so far. Because we, there's a lot of talking around in this kind of presentation. The main thing is the impermanence of all phenomena, including ourselves. Nothing which manifests remains for long. However, the sense of the continuity of objects is created by our reliance on concepts which, in the moment of their manifestation, doesn't stay long, but in the way they 
uh, articulate themselves together seems to give a comprehensive sense of an enduring world. <clears throat> Within that, we have our own particular attachment to the patterns through which we represent our sense of self. This sense of self has no true essence to it. When we examine it, we don't find any enduring qualities uh, which we can say are always with us, except for the basic I am. Then we have to look who is the one who is saying I am. Basic I am, or I am hungry, I'm tired, and so on. This I, if we look again and again, is not something we can find in a concrete way. And yet, its very openness and spaciousness allows us to say all the many different things that we say. So in this way, stillness and movement, or openness and manifestation, silence and expression, are inseparable. What we call samsara is a state where we're tilted onto the level of expression or manifestation and we tend to take things as strongly real. We take them to be what we think they are. And nirvana is where we realize that there is no true ground to any manifestation and it's like a dream. Both samsara and nirvana are as if qualities, that is to say, they are ways of experiencing. Who is the experiencer? It's always the same, unborn open awareness. So what we want to be very attentive to is the nature of our own creativity. How, as a mind, we tell stories about everything, about our past, our future, about our bodies, about other people, about nature. We live in a projected world. So part of what we want to do is to recognize when we're making a projection or an interpretation, <coughs> to then desist from that and try to see directly what is there when we don't do that projection. So, I we would suggest we uh, take a break now but, and you take the first 15 minutes of it to go outside and to engage with some of the textures of the world while the light's still there. You can touch wood, bricks, stones, plants. When you engage with that touch, tell yourself what it is. Explain the plant to the plant and to yourself. Say all the things you can possibly say about a piece of wood or a plant or a stone. And when you've exhausted all your projections, stay with the naked object itself and see what it reveals to you. From the Sokshan point of view, this deconstruction is very, very important. It's not a destroying of objects. It's not to nihilistically say there is nothing there, but rather to deconstruct the constructions that we put onto the object and then take to be inherent in the object. And this is a primary basis of a great deal of confusion, because we're not seeing clearly if we're only seeing reflections of our own projection. <coughs> Okay, so I'd invite us to go out and really engage with the textures of the world and see what is your part in creating the world. <coughs> this links into maybe into some uh, consideration of Buddhist notions of compassion. <coughs> Generally speaking, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is concerned with um, the ideal of saving all sentient beings, which includes animals, insects, denizens of other realms, and so on. 
grounded in the notion, may all beings be happy. And that is to say, an altruistic intention towards them, but also a sense of their potential. That if something has a mind, it has the potential for awakening. Because the mind always, even if it's operating in a very simple primitive level, according to the tradition, the mind always faces in two ways, as we've been looking. It faces towards its immediate involvement in what's going on, but it also faces towards its own ground, which is an openness. And this uh, unchanging, <coughs> immutable openness is called the Buddha nature. So all beings have a Buddha nature or a potential to awaken to the ground of their own being. And therefore, in order to help beings, primarily one's helping them to awaken. On an outer level, you can help people to become educated, you can help them with supplies of food, clothing, and so on. <coughs> all of which help to maintain the <coughs> bio, uh, psychological, sociological matrix within which we move. And that's useful. However, it raises the question, does life have a purpose? Is there a, are we, uh, as it were, intended for something? Is there a teleological direction? Are we goal-oriented? Buddhism, in its various uh, ways of presenting this idea, runs uh, two main channels. One is to say there is nowhere to get to because we're already there, which is rather the view we've been looking at. But it, there's also many views that say, no, indeed, there is a goal, <coughs> which is awakening of all beings, and part of that is the awakening of ourselves. Therefore, there is an orientation. We are turned towards the benefit of others, and in order to maintain that, we can only do it by ripening ourselves. So that our awakening and the awakening of others are inseparable. The reason we want to have more depth and clarity and openness is freed from its potential of being a self-referential narcissistic pursuit into it becoming a means for the benefit of others. And that again helps us to be woven back into the texture of the world. We're not starting from an individualistic place, but as participants in a universal movement towards awakening. This is different from a kind of new age idea that everything is moving <coughs> onwards and upwards, because in Buddhism we are concerned with the notion of karma, and karma is the means uh, activity, uh, action. It means that when an action occurs, an action of a subject onto an object, it leaves a trace. This trace is not the immediate result, but it's, uh, as it were, a kind of energetic or orientational consequence. For example, if I steal something, and I get away with it. Nobody finds it out. It is as if there is no punishment. Or I could be found out and arrested and have to go to a court, and then it's as if I'm being pub punished and publicly humiliated and so on. Well, no matter which of these events occurs, there is still a further consequence. The, the Tibetan term for karma is le jundre. Le means activity, ju means cause, and dre means a result. And the result is the ripening of the, the turn or the spin or the energetic involvement that we put into that action. So, generally it's considered to have four parts to it. The first is called the ji or the basis, and it means... I exist, you exist, and your wallet exists. So, I 
and living with in a world with other people who are separate from me. It's it's the, the, the basis of karma is duality. If there's no perception of duality, then activity doesn't generate karma. Because I know that you exist, and because I know you have a wallet with a lot of money in it, I develop the thought, the intention, to get that money. So, I'm now preparing a relationship between us. I then decide to activate that intention, which is the third stage, uh, and I take your wallet at a time when you don't know it's been taken. In, in the Tibetan word for that is jorwa. Jorwa means to join. It's also a word that's used for sexual union. So my intention has now united itself with the wallet. <coughs> then the fourth stage is completion, whereby I think... I've got the wallet, I'm really glad. And then counting out the money and thinking, that was a good day's work. If these four factors are all in place, you get quite a powerful turn. That is to say, I am willing to exploit other people. I don't care about other people, I care about myself. And that's seen as putting a particular spin into the line of one's life. So that later on, in this or some future life, a similar kind of spin catches you again, and you find yourself becoming suddenly sick or some difficulty arising. If, having stolen the wallet, I start to count the money, and as I open the, another part of the wallet, I see a picture of your child, and I think, oh God, what have I done? This is something precious to that person and I suddenly feel remorse, that starts to diminish some of the spin. If in the moment of taking the wallet, I think, oh, what am I doing? This is crazy. That would also reduce it. If in the moment of thinking, hey, I can nick his wallet, he never looks where he puts it. And then I think, that's a stupid idea. Why? I don't need the money. What do I want that for? That then that reduces it even further. <coughs> But the best exit is not to exist in the highly dualized world in which self and other are objectified. So in that exercise we were doing there, what some of you are recounting is that when you don't formulate a strong reading of the world, there's less of a pathway for your own individual thought about the world, and so you become part of the world. And then the thought of acting against someone else in order to privilege yourself has much less basis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's our sense of participating together in a shared endeavor, just being with each other in this world, which is the basic ground of ethical behavior. Of course, you can develop all kinds of moral codes on top of that, encouragements and prohibitions. But the basic idea is that if you stay really connected with other people, if you look them in the eye, if you feel the quality of their life, you won't harm them. You know, this is the reason why when people are being executed in, in mass uh, killings, they usually put a bullet in the back of the head. Because it gets to be a bit much for the soldiers to shoot people in the face. That's hard used to be that the prisoner would be blindfolded and there would be one dummy bullet so no soldier would ever, the soldiers would never be sure that they had actually shot someone. Because shooting someone in cold blood is hard. So if you see someone's face, how much more difficult to kill? In the same way, if you really live face to face with people, then the little... <coughs> pipe that runs from the eyes into the heart is washed clean every time you really have heartfelt eye contact with someone else. You know, like in London, going to work in the tube, you know, everybody is so glazed and so cut off. It's really quite disturbing. So I have to make a conscious effort to kind of 
engage people and they look at me, why are you staring at me? <laughs> because if I, blank, <clears throat> if I blank myself off in the way to work and then I get in and see my first patient, what would be the basis for something kind of switching this on? It's as if it's something completely artificial to be welcoming to another human being. When in fact, it's completely artificial not to be welcoming to other human beings. And uh, that, that's the, the struggle of, of our work, especially in these alienated times, to remain connected and to identify as pathological the interruptions to heartfelt contact. So on an outer level, we have many supports for that. For example, the general Buddhist uh, belief, it is a belief, but it's, it's um, if you like, a skillful means kind of belief, because you can't prove it in any way, that because we've all been born many, many times before, and in each life we've had a mother, every sentient being that we meet whether it's an ant on the path, or a bird on the sky, or someone in a train, each of these beings has been our mother. And in that life, when they were our mother, they have done many, many kind <coughs> things for us. Taken care of us when we were small and vulnerable, <coughs> fed us, cleaned us, and so on. Worried about us, thought about us. And in the course of that mental activity, they've given themselves some trouble. So. When I approach another sentient being, it's in the position of someone who is in debt to them. That is to say, everyone we meet is not a stranger, but somebody who has already been taking care of us. So, in that sense, we are under an obligation to all beings. That's a very different way of beginning, isn't it? And not only that, you can take it further and think, when that person <coughs> was my mother and taking care of me, because there was no money, maybe she had to steal, maybe she had to do bad things in order to get food for me, the reason she is suffering now is due to her care for me. That turns up the heat a little bit. <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> Then we convert to the Holy Catholic Church, <laughs> where guilt is very popular. <laughs> but if you hold that sense, then, then the troubles of the world are in the palm of my hand. Now that could seem like a hellish punishment, that could seem like a sort of mad megalomania. But if you think about it, it's a way of not feeling like a puppet, like at the mercy of things. You know, so often we have natural tragedies that occur. There are big floods or fires, and people say, why did that happen? And it talks about the poor victims, the helpless ones. From the point of view of Dharma, there is always an ethical cause behind suffering. And if we take that close to ourselves, it means something must be done. So instead of just being kind of poor little creatures wandering in a world where big forces blow us around like leaves in the autumn wind, we take up a position that says, due to the kindness of others taking care of me, they now suffer, I myself will do whatever I can to help them. So our lives are woven together the lives of all beings, which means not privileging our friends as special, not wanting to do harm or keep distant our enemies, but to say all beings are entitled to an equal share of my care. Although due to the obligation of being a parent or a child of some in this life, I have particular responsibilities, in my heart, I will maintain an openness of availability to these beings. That's very, very radical. Because most of the time, we are kind of protective to our friends. We are sort of neutral-ish to people we don't really know. And we are quite wary and uh, guarded around our enemies. 
from this point of view, if somebody behaves as an enemy towards us, we have more obligation to help them. So, for example, <coughs> when uh, I was living with my uh, teacher in India, uh, Mao Zedong died. And we did a lot of uh, pujas, a lot of uh, ritual practices for the happy rebirth of Mao Zedong. And Mao Zedong in himself was largely responsible for the destruction of the traditional Tibet, which had caused my teacher to leave Tibet. But he said, when someone like that suffers, and uh, when someone like that dies, they are on the brink of a huge amount of suffering. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are the ones who need our help. So, why would we not help him? Oh, because he harmed your country. That is irrelevant. This is a sentient being who's going to suffer. So, in that way, one can take away the projection of one's own personal antipathy towards the person, one's own feeling, they have harmed me, so why should I do something for them? That tit-for-tat revengeful move, and think, all suffering requires healing, all suffering requires help. It doesn't matter who is suffering, suffering is suffering, all beings have been my mother. That's a very radical deconstruction of our normal self-centered way of proceeding. It says, I have no enemies. <coughs> there are people who in their lostness cause me harm, but they cannot be my enemy because I don't want to turn my face away from them. If I keep my face turned towards them, I can see through whatever they're doing towards me to some of the causes and conditions that give rise to that. Clearly working in uh, psychotherapy that can be very useful with some uh, patients who are very disturbed and very destructive and angry and one has to see that although they may be causing a lot of trouble for the people who are trying to help them, they are not the enemy. Retaliation would have no point. What we can have to try to do is to help them reconnect with the ground of their own being which has been distorted by their pain and caused them to lash out in a, in a madness which will potentially alienate most people. So that basic principle is taken up on a very large scale. <coughs> so, <coughs> with the intention to help all sentient beings, <coughs> the first stage is in the manner of planning to go on a, someone planning to go on a journey. I will help all beings. I will go to Paris. Something that I will do in the future, but I'm strengthening my intention. The second stage is to actually go on the journey, to engage day by day in working for others. Clearly, <coughs> we only have two legs and two hands, there's, <clears throat> on, a, on a finite level, there's not all that much we can do. So, in the tradition, what we do is we include all beings in everything we do, all the time. So, imagine ourselves all the time surrounded by all sentient beings. So, if we are drinking a cup of tea, we imagine that delicious liquids are going to the mouths of all beings. If we're eating some food, we imagine that delicious food is going to all beings, whether they're in a hungry hell realm, whether they're in a happy God realm. At all times, there are no beings who we say, they're sorted, it's nothing to do with me. Or we'll only help the ones who are in a bad condition. Ah, oh, these others are fine. There is nobody who's fine if they're not awake to their own nature. So it's an ongoing process of ceaseless inclusion. You can include that in everything you do. When you're walking down the street, everybody who's coming towards you, you can inside say, may you be happy, may you be well, may your troubles vanish. And just having that orientation breaks this uh, seal, this uh, perspex wall that tends to arise between us. Moreover, <coughs> uh, we can imagine rays of light coming out of our heart and going out to all sentient beings. 
so that whatever virtues and happiness we have is shared out with all beings. So before we do anything, whether it's eating or a meditation practice, we can connect with all beings. And at the end of the practice, we can dedicate the merit or share out whatever goodness has been involved. The function of this again and again is to undermine the sense of duality. That there is a real difference between self and other. The third aspect of compassion is called the compassion which does not take an object. That is to say, it's non-dual compassion. It means that, for example, when we do this open practice and we're resting in presence, then because there is no limit to this presence, because it's not contained inside the skin bag of our body, it's not contained inside this room in the, in the circle of the people who are interested in understanding more about this. It's not in just this little uh, bunch of houses. It's not just in this area of Britain. The mind is infinite. So in the resting, in the infinity of the mind, all beings are included within it. When we see that the self has no color or shape or uh, true continuing content as its basis for its identity, everything is within it. Everything that occurs is the experience of the mind. Our body, the room, it doesn't mean that the body is just an illusion, the body has its absolute facticity, its <coughs> sensation and so on. <coughs> But we experience the body as experience. It reveals itself to us in its presentation. Who is that presentation offered to? Our presence. The more present we are, the more of the body on its all and its many different levels can reveal itself. It's the same with other beings. The more we open to them, the more of them, the more textures and qualities reveal themselves. Out and out and out and out. So in, with this level of compassion, by remaining open, all beings are included in that openness. And we can start to respond to other beings from our openness. In another language you could call this <coughs> intuition. In the Tibetan it's called Tlenchi Chepa, which means born together. It means the, the spontaneous co-emergence of what we call subject and what we call object. Which means that if we attend to another person, we'll find the way to be with them. And that finding of it is not something that we have to work out intellectually, conceptually. We will find ourselves doing the right thing. How can that be? It's because actually subject and object are not different. It's not that we're having to work hard <coughs> to remove non-duality, uh, the, the, the barrier to non-duality. The fact is that the non-dual is the natural state. It is duality which is the effortful construct. And so, when we relaxed and open, why would we not have a felt sense of where other people are? We reveal ourselves to each other all the time. We do it through our eyes, the lines around our eyes, our mouths, our gesture, our posture. We're showing ourselves moving out or moving back. If we trust that, then our lives can flow more easily with other beings. So it's not about thinking about some master plan or how will I help this person, because that would imply that I can work out what this person needs, as if it was some kind of package of foreign aid to a country in Africa. 
Rather, it's by being there with the other that the movement of contact arises. A contact which is both proximate, it gets very close to where the other is, but it doesn't invade and it doesn't abandon. And this is the very important thing, that we rest fully in our skin, not being too much, not being too little, without having to control it. That relaxed, open presence is of itself connective. That the connection is what the world is. It's our own habits, our own preoccupations, our own conceptualization, which causes the disunity, the tear that we experience between us. And then we develop thoughts about the other person, and then we're thinking, well, how do I get from what's in my head to what's in your head? Because you seem pretty weird to me. And why do you seem weird to me? Because you're not like me. Whereas in relaxed open presence, we've, re we've let go of the sense of what I'm like. We're not maintaining a, a self-image or a self-construct, but we are open as our presence, and that then allows us to have contact. And that's something we can experience for ourselves. That when we are not thinking about other people, which I, I would suggest always involves some degree of reification and objectification, when we're not doing that, the walls between us are not there. We're not taking a wall down, we're just not putting it up. It's a lot of effort to separate ourselves from other people. You know, sometimes I see very uh, schizoid patients or schizotypal patients, that's to say people who have a great deal of difficulty in relating to others. And, and they are, in all the cases I've experienced, these poor people are tormented by trying to solve the problem of the world. They're trying to think their way out of isolation into having contact. But you can't do that because the more you think and think about how I should be and what, why other people have acted in that way towards me, you enter into this endless series of signifiers that just goes on and on and on. And because there's no end to thinking, you never get to the simple clarity that if you say hello to someone, they're likely to say hello back. And you take it from there. But if you want to know how I should be in order to get the other person to be the way I want them to be, that takes you into a very advanced chess game. Because there are so many moves that could be made, so many variables. And of course, if you're in the state trying to count out these variables, you're going to miss the beat when you're actually with the other person. You're going to be trying to find a way into get in the right moment, which will knock you off the moment. So in a paradoxical way, simply by relaxing and opening and being fully in touch with what's there, we will find what has to be done without effort. <coughs> if you're available, like for example, some of the people have been working very hard and running the weekend, and some people join in. And I was looking uh, just before lunch, a whole bunch of people uh, down in the kitchen area. And I, I was very impressed because people were doing what had to be done. They looked and they saw and the body moved. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> they were not having to ask, should I do this, should I do that? They're just doing that. And someone else would say, well, maybe you can put it there. Okay. No, one said, oh yeah, but I want to put it here. Huh? There was no kind of mental activity of that defensive kind. It was simply that this is the task, and, and the task had a kind of flavor, almost like a, a rhythm, and so in feeling the nature of the task, bodies could move in harmony, not banging into each other, and the task was done. That's a very beautiful. And I would imagine for the people engaged in that, it's. It's sort of affirming. You feel also part of something. 
So, again, whether it's the path of wisdom or the aspect of compassion, both of these are blocked to us by over-reliance on our conceptualization. Now you might think, I've been doing an awful lot of conceptualization and talking all about this. But the idea is to just simply use this as a kind of screwdriver or a clutch or the spoon that you would use to change a, a tire on a bicycle. We want to have some leverage to ease ourselves out of the habitual tracks of our ordinary conceptualization and allow the world to show us what has to be done. So being compassionate is not, from this point of view, it's not a noble activity. It's not something that kind of higher order beings do. It's not something unusual or something that we should have to sweat about. It's as ordinary, as easy as breathing in and out. Connectivity is the ground, is the basis. Disconnection is the aberration or the pathology. But this pathology has no ground of its own. So as soon as one gently releases from it, one's back in the healthy ground. So it's not like there are two domains, but the pathology of separation is simply caused by the sort of whirlwind, whirlwind of auto-intoxication that we looked at earlier. This kind of practice, if you do it on your own, uh, one of the things you can be attentive to is the ending of the, the meditation. Sometimes people do meditation by setting a, a, a timer in some way or thinking, I'm going to sit for 20 minutes. But what we also want to be aware of is what is the the movement between what we might call a state of meditation of openness and, and the movement into engagement with the world. You could have a high threshold at this point or almost no threshold at all. Because we're sitting there and experiences occurring, thoughts, feelings, sensations, sounds arising and passing. We're present with them but we are not, as it were, manifesting as them. At a certain point, we find ourselves gesturing. We maybe get up and go and make a cup of tea, or get ready to go to work, or make a phone call. What is the nature of that arising? Like, what does it mean to be me? You can easily uh, make meditation into a kind of holiday. It's time out from your ordinary life. But essentially, we want to have our ordinary life as a manifestation of the state of meditation. 
So, when we're sitting in an open way, the openness of the mind is not something we see directly, but it's revealed to us by the ceaseless flow of um, manifestation. If you have a pond of water, then you look at it and the wind might blow the surface a little bit, but the, the volume of water in the pond is not going to change in five minutes. Unless, of course, some river's coming in and another river's going out. But if it's a sealed pond, it just is what it is. If you're looking at a river, the water is flowing through the bed or along the bed of the river, and there is no obstacle, then the river is flowing. If it hits some rocks or hits a dam, then the flow is interrupted. In the same way, when we're in the meditation, we're just like a river in flow. Whatever comes, comes. No choice has to be made to edit it, because the work we're doing at that point is the ongoing work of loosening up our controlling, critical, editing notion of this is right, this is wrong, I accept, I don't accept, and so on. So we're trying to release ourselves from that busyness. Then, meditation's over, we're moving into the domain of busyness. Is that busyness other than the stillness, or inseparable from the stillness? This is the essential point. If we slice a line at that point, we think, right, better get on with the day. Then we, we make a kind of tear in which we're saying there are two <coughs> separate domains, each with their own logic and rules. But we're sitting, and then we get up. So how do we get up? Say you're on a mat or on a chair, your arm moves, your legs move, and your body rises. <coughs> The body is in flow. Where is it flowing? It's flowing in the field of experience. So you're not going out of one state into another state. Rather, the relative stasis of the meditation achieved through just being present with what is happening has meant Awareness and flow have been held together, but I've been tilted towards the side of awareness. When I'm getting up, I'm now wanting to integrate the gestures of manifestation in its ground of uh, openness. Now, I don't have to integrate this, because it is always integrated. What I have to do is not disintegrate it by getting wrapped up in my own thoughts. Oh, I better hurry, I'm going to be late for work. And now I'm back up in the mental busyness, which is cutting me off from my own ground. So we have, again, these three aspects. We have the openness of ungraspable awareness. We have all that's revealed in it the richness of the mind, the field of experience. And now, as we get up from meditation, we have the movements, the very precise movements of gesture, posture, lifting a telephone, dialing a number, speaking to kids or whatever. This is occurring within the integrated field of experience. What is arising? Sound, thought, feeling, arising and passing. So say you speak to your children, they're going to say something that's going to probably wind you into <laughs> familiar conversation. <coughs> is that necessary? What they are saying, what you hear coming in your ear is sound. You can enter, you, you can allow that sound to enter your habitual interpretations of what it means and what they're up to and why they're doing this and that. And that sets up a lot of mental activity. Or you just hear what they're saying. You offer them some space. They say, oh, I've done this and I don't know what's happening and why I'm away at the weekend. Da, da, da. 
Yeah, oh yeah, well, it sounds like it's hard for you. I have no solution. <laughs> you walk on your own feet. And, but they want to play. So you, this is the invitation to a game, and it's a particular kind of a game. It's a game, I'm, you know, like when you play rugby, you try to push people over. This is a similar kind of game. We're going to help other people lose their own ground so that when they tumble on the ground, we all roll together in the mire of samsara. But we want to keep this groundedness so that when we're speaking and responding, it's within a field of shared experience, the nature of which is empty. Sound is emptiness, form is emptiness. It doesn't mean that it's nothing at all, but it also doesn't mean that it's strongly real. The game of samsara is to lock into things as being very, very important. Lots of things happen in life that are terrible, that are hellish, that we don't want to happen. But there are always events happening through time. Even something very terrible like being in a car crash, it happens. The car crash lasts 30 seconds. Then you're lying in the road for 30 minutes. Then you're in an ambulance and you're in a hospital. Then you have the consequence. Each of these are moments spread out along the trajectory of time. They are not solid, they are intense. Intensity is a compacted vibration, but the vibration is moving through time. So in that way, everything is unfolding. It's unfolding when we're sitting in the meditation. Stuff is occurring, outer noises, inner bodily sensations and so on. And when we engage with other people, the same thing is happening. We talk, they listen, they talk, we listen. These are moments unfolding. What is being created? Progressions of movement. What is being consolidated? Nothing at all. Nothing is ever established as an enduring fact. This is the nature of impermanence. This is not a dogma or a belief. It's something you can check out for yourself. Even if you have a really horrible row with people close to you, mm. it doesn't last all that long. The echoes and reverberations can go on, but they tend to be because you don't let go of them. Everything happens in time. So, not over-investing any moment with the burden of having to be the real truth, an enduring fact in one's existence, and so on, we have the direct felt immediacy of the encounter with the other person, which is what it is, and establishes nothing. So the next moment is open and free, and the next moment is open and free. Of course, we have to apply little bits of olive oil to keep the system running. We have to be able to say, I'm sorry. We have to be able to say, oh, that was my fault. We have to be able to say, I wasn't very skillful. Apologizing is one of the most useful skills we can acquire in life because it just eases the road jam. We, we move around the issue. It, we're not beating ourselves up if we do that. We're just acknowledging, I made a move which got in your way. It's not my intention to block your path because your path is your path. I don't know what your path is. So I'm going to move to the side. Then life goes on. There, there are very few... Uh, in fact, there are no final moments. Where we die, but... Nobody can say for sure what happens when we die. I personally don't believe it's the end, but if we imagine that it is the end, until that point, no matter how difficult things are, there's always something else. So to make an intense, unpleasant moment final, to make it a cut in existence, is generally very, very unhelpful. Because as we've been looking, our actual situation is non-dual. 
there is no real separation between us. So when we get locked into fights with people and we turn our back on them and say, this is unworkable, that's absolutely tragic. Because you can't get rid of the other person. Other people are our world. That's the fact. Other people are what we see and hear all the time. So getting rid of the dangerous other or the unwanted other simply diminishes ourselves because we haven't learned how to stay in contact with that which is difficult. So hanging in there is very important. And what we've been looking at in terms of the meditation is to say, staying present with whatever is occurring and not coming to a fixed, finite conclusion allows us to stay in the flow. But if we say, that was unforgivable, I'm not going to put up with that, that's terrible, when we find ourselves talking in that very robust way, there are so many full stops that we're inserting in the story. It starts to shudder, it becomes staccato. Really, we want to put in commas. We want to say, I don't like it when you speak to me like that, or I'm not going to put up with that, and we still need to talk. So in that way, the, the movement from the meditation into being in the world with others is about the endless coiling and uncoiling of the possibilities of being close to each other as we find connection and then lose connection. But it's always unfolding in time. So meditation need never end but sitting meditation and meditation in the world with others is slightly different. When we're sitting, we're tilted more towards openness. When we're moving with others, we're more towards connectedness. But the connection and the openness are part and parcel of the same uh, basic structure. <laughs> so we now just have a couple of sessions this morning. Uh, in the first session, I'll do some more uh, introduction to the principles of Dzogchen, and then in the next one we can have some more time for discussion, and you can raise any questions, and particularly think about how you might take some of this into your daily life. <coughs> so we start with the, the practice of the moon, beginning with the three R's, and then just resting in an open way and becoming the hospitality that is present with all things. of the moon on water, on a full moon night if you're out in a quiet place and you see the reflection of the moon on the still surface of the pond, it seems as if the moon is exactly there. You can see all the details with clarity and yet of course the moon is not in the pond. So we 
would say it is as if that is the case. <coughs> the, the large part of Dharma is to move from a very uh, strong sense of the reality of things, a literal reading, to a much more a metaphorical reading. That whatever we say carries within it a kind of tentativeness. Not an anxious tentativeness, it's not that we are uh, insecure about what we're going to say, but we know that even as we say it, it's never quite <coughs> correct. It's never quite the case. Because as soon as we're in language, there are always many different descriptions that we can have of anything. So, I'm going to now uh, talk about the nature of the mind using the traditional images of Tibetan Buddhism. <coughs> this is not uh, an accurate description of something because it can't really be described. More, these are a series of metaphors or allusions designed to evoke a particular kind <coughs> of uh, softness or openness or uh, appreciation in ourselves. Because the, the, the open state is a state of being. It's not something uh, which is constructed out of thought. It's therefore not something which can be lost. It is at the actuality of how we are, of who we are. And so, in order to settle into ourselves, a settling into a self that we have never really left, we have to just gently ease ourselves away from the concrete appropriation of the world, which leads us into grasping and accumulation and building up all our thoughts about things. So, in describing the mind, it's said to be naked. Naked means not covered. That doesn't mean that there's nothing there at all. For example, we're sitting here, all of us are clothed, but under the clothes we have our naked bodies. The clothes that we wear cover our nakedness, but they don't really remove it. It's not that we're not naked when we have clothes on, it's just that our nakedness can't be seen. In the same way, when we become absorbed <coughs> in the thoughts and feelings and sensations, the preoccupations of our ordinary life, we become obsessed by the kind of clothing that we're wearing. We're wondering whether people like our clothes, do they agree with what we say, do they appreciate what we do for them and so on. This, this is the cladding, this is the habit, like a monk puts on a habit, we have our mental habits, which we uh, wrap around or eat ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two ways of understanding this. One would be that we have a Buddha nature, like a precious jewel, that is somehow hidden inside or covered up by these thoughts, which is the sort of general understanding in what's called Mahayana, or large vehicle Buddhism. And therefore, the task is to remove the clothing remove the obscurations so that one can see directly and freshly what's hidden behind it. However, from the point of view of Sokshen, what we want to appreciate is that the clothing is the expression or the creativity or the radiance of the naked state itself. That is to say, we should wear clothes that suit the shapes of our bodies, that has some kind of relation to the color of our eyes and so on. Then we say that the, the person's flesh and their clothing are in harmony, and that gives a true expression of themselves. If you wear clothes that don't fit you or are of the wrong color, there's a kind of discordancy and you're not likely to feel at home in that. 
So what we want to see is the relation between the open state, which is often called the ground or the source, and what arises from it. So the nakedness of the mind is not placed in opposition to the various <coughs> kinds of clothing that we wear, but rather that the clothing is seen as communicative. That is to say, <coughs> most of us don't have only one kind of clothing. In some cultures you always wear exactly the same kind of dress. Or monks in a monastery or nuns will, or every day be wearing exactly the same kind of uniform. But if we're not in that situation, <coughs> we wear different clothes for different reasons. For example, the changes of the seasons brings about uh, some things being put away in drawers and some things being taken out and, and put onto our body. We also change our clothing for social situations. That it's in some situations it's appropriate to be in a very relaxed mode. For others, whether we like it or not, the, the deal, the cultural contract, is to look in a very formal way. And if you arrive there dressed informally, it's not going to work so well, because it creates a, a kind of uh, opposition or even hostility to the, the group mood. In that way, we can see that clothing is communication. We communicate our desires, our worldly status, our age and so on from uh, the way we dress. We have the rather insulting phrase, mutton dressed as lamb, <laughs> which speaks of a certain kind of uh, notion of social dressing, doesn't it? So that no matter how somebody feels about themselves, how they can dress is socially determined, unless they want to be uh, quite... Uh, powerfully individual and then they're going to get someone else's reading run across what they're doing in the same way the thoughts feelings sensations even that arise can be understood as either a covering as some kind of private realm something which covers up our own openness or as the effulgence of that openness. That is to say, what are we in the service of? What, what is our mind for? That if you have the openness and the emptiness, and you relax into that, there is a profound satisfaction. It's enough. At peace. So then when activity or movement is arising... Who is it for? What is it for? It's about connection with other people. Mm -hmm. In the traditional uh, language of Tibetan Buddhism, they say that the Dharmakaya, the, the nature of the mind itself, the infinitely pure awareness, that is for ourselves. And the Rupakaya, the, the form bodies, that is to say the Sambhogakaya and the Nimalakaya, the body of the radiant field and the body of precise manifestation, these are for the other. That's it. This is just another way of saying what I'm suggesting. That manifestation is communicative. Manifestation is in the, the side of compassion and awareness itself is the side of wisdom. From this point of view, wisdom isn't something you accumulate. It's not a a, a built-up store of helpful cognitions about something, but rather it is the integration of all that we do, all that we experience, into its own ground. It's not that we have to integrate it, we're not having to weave these two things together. Rather, all we have to do is to stop disintegrating it. And we disintegrate it by particularized attention. For example, if you have a family and uh, there are several children in the family and the parents, for whatever reason, start to take against one of the children and they start to develop a mental image that this one is trouble. 
that focusing of attention which leads to blaming that particular child whenever anything goes wrong leads to a fundamental crack or fragmentation in the interactions in the family because now one child is being stereotyped they're becoming the scapegoat the, the, the point in, in there is that attention if it's not panoramic if it's not grounded in equanimity if it's not even and unbiased starts to set up particular kinds of turbulence why does that happen because the relative ground or the immediate basis whereby we pay attention to things tends to be located in our personal sense of what I like and what I don't like what I'm willing to put up with and what I'm not willing to put up with so the very limitation of my own sense of myself in which I become the limit of what I'm willing to tolerate then brings me in the giving of my attention to privilege the things I like, I don't, to want to reject or even eliminate the things I don't like. This creates a split. It's not an even, open attention. It's not a hospitality. It's actually a state of prejudice. And this kind of subtle prejudice is pervasive in what's called samsara. We, we always have our biases. It's, again, it's not that one shouldn't have a particular taste. If somebody likes to wear blue or likes to wear red or somebody never eats wheat and only wants to eat barley, that's fine. They know something about their constitution or their aesthetic. That's fine. It's the degree of value that's placed in that. If one can hold it as if, that is to say to hold it lightly, it is as if I am condemned always to wear yellow shoes. <laughs> so, I, for some reason, I always wear yellow shoes, so I have yellow shoes. If that's somebody's situation, that's fine. But if they say, I cannot wear any other kinds of shoes, because it would be a fundamental violence against myself, then we can see that there is an overinvestment in that position. Between something which is a choice within a field, but it's held as a choice that has much lighter feeling to it than an absolute demand. If I don't get this, mm. I will not be at ease and I will make sure your life is hard too. That has a particular edge to it. So differentiation in the world, the richness of the world, that's not the problem. The problem is when we make selections whether we can hold them lightly or not. And holding them lightly here means seeing whatever I choose is just an, an empty choice. It's like a rainbow in the sky. It's ungraspable. It is as if this is really important. And if it doesn't work out, well, something else will happen. We do have to choose. Why do we have to choose? Because we are favored by a world of infinite richness. <coughs> Even if you are an absolute pauper and you have no money, if you go out for a walk, you have to choose which way you're going to walk. You have to choose what side of the road you're going to walk on. If a car comes towards you, do you jump up on the left bank or the right bank? I mean, choice is just part of our existence. The question is, if we see that as part of the movement within the moving world, or it becomes a rigid fixation where I'm using my habitual choice as a way of confirming some solidified existence for myself. I am the kind of entity which must have this in order to function. That kind of concretized statement becomes the problem. Because then you see the, the clothing is defensive. The clothing is an attempt to protect us against the vulnerability of our self-construct, which will feel agitated or anxious or undermined if it can't get its own way. 
can see that with, with children sometimes. You know, if you if you chop their fish finger into three pieces instead of into four pieces, they say, I can't eat it. You spoil it. <laughs> because it doesn't look right. It's not an uncommon experience. So the old, we see how in that moment how how terribly small the child's world has been. It has to be just right. And very often, children, six, seven, eight, sort of age, become very anxious around bedtime. And things, they, they develop little rituals about what toys have to be in the bed with them or not in the bed with them. Or they're in the bed with them for five minutes and then they have to be kicked out onto the floor in order to say, this is how my life has to be. We ourselves have similar patterns in terms of all the kind of coverings or habits or clothing that we have. And this is particularly important in terms of meditation, because when we sit, we become aware of the wide range of contents that arise in our mind. Many of the thoughts seem kind of strange, sort of wondering, what has this to do with me? Why am I having this thought? They might be negative persecutory thoughts, they might be uh, fantasies of happiness or indulgence, they might be completely tedious thoughts, disturbing thoughts. When we talk of hospitality, it means to give space to all of these. These are what is happening, but I don't like them. I don't like them is also something which is happening. So, you get a negative thought which makes you feel bad and then you think, I don't like this. Both of these are thoughts. If you stay present with these thoughts, they will arise and pass. If you are indignant at the negative thought you don't like, and you give you the full energy of your arousal to the resistance to it, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. One thought is now being bound by another thought, which will lead to another thought, which will lead to another thought. And so you have these chains of thought that run around. And inside each step of that, it seems that each position is true and vital and necessary. But it's just empty phenomena. Empty phenomena. We ourselves are saying this is intolerable. And again, you can look outside. You can look around this room and you can just look at the clothes people are wearing and you can imagine how would it be for you to wear their clothes. Can you see people in this room wearing clothes that you would rather die than wear? <laughs> so, in, in that way you can see that what fits different people is particular to them. It is absolutely fine for each person to wear what they wear. That is them being them, but it has no further currency than the circle that you can draw around their feet. That is their private domain. It's not that, oh, everyone should wear that because it looks so good. That would have no meaning. In the same way, if you observe your own prejudices, when we're sitting in the meditation and you find yourself again and again resisting some sort of arising, not wanting that to be there. That's just your particular taste. Someone else might be tolerant to that thought. So it's, it's to see that there is not an objective truth to your own resistance to things. It's just your particular take on it, your taste. And so in the practice we relax, we open, and we try to taste something which is distasteful. 
Just allow the thought to be there. This isn't right. This doesn't fit me. Because at that point, you are at the absolute crossroads of freedom or imprisonment. And the paradox is, if you follow your desire, I don't want this, get out of my mind, you feel that you're establishing freedom for yourself, but you're actually binding yourself into the prison. And if you put up with a thought which seems so horrible and distasteful, it feels like you're shackling yourself to something unpleasant, like tying your body to a dead corpse. But, in fact, it's the door of freedom. Because if you stay with it, two things will happen. One is this unpleasant experience will pass. And also the, the experience of the un pleasantness of that experience will also pass. So, as it were, the object will pass and the subject will pass. And if you do that again and again, you start to think, what was all that about? What was all that turbulence that I spent years and years and years doing, trying to maintain this fixed image of my mind? This fixed sense of who I am, what's good for me, what's not good for me. It doesn't mean that you should just throw yourself out into the world and eat any old stuff and wear any old thing. It's not about that. It's about seeing what is the energy or what is the driver underneath the choices we make. We have to wear clothes. We have to eat something. We have so many choices. We're going to have to decide. But what... What is the nature of that choice? Is it light and communicative and exploratory? Is it uh, just what it is in the moment? Or is it serving the purpose of affirming, I am this thing? That's the essential point of change in, in meditation. As to start seeing the nature of habit or karmic accumulation, or patterning, that these pathways, which are so easy to follow because we've been running them for a long time, are not just functional in that they achieve particular tasks, but they have been invested with a sense of being our true identity. And it's that investment which hides our actual nature, this openness from ourselves. Because if we think we are somebody who doesn't like margarine, if we think we just, oh, I can't eat that, then that is a limit. You may not like to eat it, but it's not <coughs> poisonous. If you did eat it, it would be the taste of margarine in your mouth. Oh, I prefer some gorgeous olive oil. You may well prefer it. But margarine is a taste, olive oil is a taste, they are both tastes. The fact that you prefer one is a particular configuration. It's not an absolute truth. And the, it goes back to what we looked at at the beginning yesterday of what do we take refuge in? What is our identity resting on? If our self-construct is embedded in prejudices, in narrow particular readings, then we're always going to be defending it. Because even if it's olive oil, it's not exactly the right olive oil. Because we remember one summer in Tuscany, in a little restaurant, and the bread was like this, and the olive oil was like this. And so that perfect moment, has caused me to piss on every other kind of thing. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Experiences can be very, very punishing in life because it's never that perfect coffee again. <laughs> so in that way, knowing what we like has to be held lightly so that, of course, you can have that choice. But if it doesn't happen, it's okay. And it's okay because it's not over-invested. So the, the, the key thing here is to separate the aesthetics of existence, mm -hmm. the delight we can have in shapes, colors, tastes, smells, music, and so on, 
from ego identification, which causes these fragile moments to carry a burden they can't really manage. What is that burden? It is the sense of self which has been cut off from its own ground. The ego feels heavy, but awareness is always light. Why is this? Because awareness is resting on its own ground. It's merged in space. When the sense of self is cut off from that, it's condensed, it becomes like a sort of oxo cube. And that then carries a kind of burden, a gravity, which we're then looking for things that we can sit on. And you can build your life on anything. Some people build it on fly fishing for salmon. Some people build it on sailing small boats. Some people build it on their allotment. Some people uh, build it on dieting. You know, you can, you can build your life around anything. You can invest meaning and value in any kind of activity. Some people invest in how many pheasants they can kill in a season. People will register any kind of pattern as being the validation of their existence. But it never quite works. Because this year I bagged 1,342 pheasants and next year, well, the weather wasn't so good, so this is a personal best, but I want to beat my own record. This is the kind of mad accumulating vision which pervades so much of sport. We're going to have the Olympic Games next year. It's going to be a barrage of statistics about one second and a point point zero one of a second. What the hell does it matter? If somebody is pushing themselves and pushing themselves so that they probably get a heart attack by the time they're 50 in order to get a little badge. <laughs> this is bogus, but it's about national pride. And Britain will be desperate to do well in the league. And we get these tight little BBC voices saying how oh, Britain is moving ahead on the car of the heavens. That's so exciting. <laughs> and you think of how much money has been invested in that, the whole refurbishing of East London, public transport. If you live in London, the tubes are almost cancelled because of new things that have been done to modernise them. Because something has been invested with a huge amount of energy. Same with wars. War is a huge amount of energy. In America, it seems nobody knows the cost of the military apparatus. You, you cannot, although they have much more freedom of information than we have in Britain, it's impossible to really work out how much money is spent by the military because there are so many hidden budgets for particular groupings. I think all that money mobilized for a particular purpose. You think how much effort is mobilized for awakening, for being in touch with ourselves. Some of us here have been involved in meditation for many, many years. But many years doesn't mean many hours sitting on a cushion. <laughs> it just means once upon a time, a long time ago, when I started to do this. You think life is going by. Why is it that being distracted in the world seems so much more tasty and tempting than trying to be with myself. Why <coughs> would going shopping be more interesting than knowing who is the one who is going shopping? Mm -hmm. It's very bizarre. Mm -hmm. This external movement of the mind, the idea that the answer lies in the object, that somewhere there is the golden fleece or the object of the pilgrimage, and if only we get one piece of the, the true cross and we bring it home and put it in a shrine, we'll be happy. But an object is an object, and we are not an object. We are a subject. What is the nature of the subject? So, nakedness can start to be explored in this kind of way. It's also said that the mind is fresh. Fresh means straight in the moment of its arising. It means not cooked, not altered, not changed. It's just freshly arisen. When we sit in this room, we can have the memory that we were here yesterday. So this room can already be lined with memories. The kinds of conversations you had, things we've talked about, having maybe a cup of tea in here. 
opening the doors, feeling the fresh air coming in and so on. These memories, in the moment they arise, are fresh. The actual arising of each moment is fresh, though the content may be, as if you like, stale or stable. Two and two is four. Two and two is four. Two and two is four. We've been saying this for a long time. We had to learn it in school. We know it to be true. You might help your children to understand it. Something is repeated. When you fall into the semantic content, the meaning part of the expression, you have the thought, the memory, the sense, I said this before, I know this, oh, it's boring, stop telling me it, I know it. But you don't know it like this. You don't know it like this. Two and two is four is the first time we've heard it here. But I just said it a little bit before. Oh, but not like this. It's always different. Time has moved on. People's bodies in the room have moved. Somebody's coughed. Seeing it the next time is in a changed field. So freshness means not to be mesmerized and caught up in the semantic content so that you build a composite picture of something and then you know it's true. And then because you know it's true, it's not so exciting. And if it's not so exciting, it doesn't hold your attention. You take it for granted. You want to leave it there as part of the, the givenness of the world. And yet, in its presentation, it has never been presented quite like this. So, what is the nature of staleness? Why is it that we can experience kind of boredom, and dissatisfaction or feel we're just going through the motions what what is that it's a sense of here we go again it's always the same my life doesn't get better oh god is it going to be like this forever i can't bear it oh not again not again means something is being repeated from the point of view of freshness this is always a misinterpretation because nothing can be repeated. In the moment of its arising, it's always fresh. Every cup of tea you have, every time you stand up, it's fresh, it's new. I've done it before. What have you done before? I've, I've walked down that road, I know what it's like. You don't know what it's like today. Listen, I'll tell you what you'll find if you walk down that road. I will give you an account. And be, there's five houses in that road. And the, all the people always park their cars. Okay, what order will the cars be parked in? I don't know, they always change. Exactly, they always change. What will be there? So here again we can see very clearly the difference between the immediacy of the complexity of the phenomenological configuration the actual aesthetic patterning of the world and the organization of our interpretation of that into conceptual patterns. That is to say, we construct maps and the map goes from being a guide to the territory to a substitute for the territory. So you walk along the street in your mental map and only if your map is contradicted by something alarming in the actual field do you wake up and start to look and see what's there. It's like when people are driving on automatic pilot. So freshness means staying here in the moment and experiencing the arising of phenomena. It's a of course then clearly linked with impermanence. If the last moment is gone, a new moment is coming. If it's new, it's new. Even if it seems to have the same content as before. Because the field in which it is occurring is always changing. Okay? Now, 
when we ignore the field, when we isolate ourselves, when we're just living in our own skin bag and not really attending to what is going on, we can stay conceptually with our sense of how things are. As soon as you attend to where you are in the world with others, which of course is the only place you ever are, and we are always connected with other people, our changes and their changes bring new configurations moment by moment. Mm. Are these significant or not? Well, they won't be if you're concerned with the meta picture. Oh, yes, I know there are micro changes, little things happen, but that's not what I'm concerned about. What we need to do in planning is this. And this planning is one of the ultimate ways of the violence of modernism, is imposing grid-like structures and getting people to align themselves. You know, Marx and Engels in their study of uh, factory life, particularly Engels' study of the development of manufacturing in Manchester, is very illuminating to this, looking at what happens when you put people into factories. There are huge consequences. And one of the things that he points out is that the routing of the roads into Manchester from the bourgeois suburbs of the grand houses of the factory owners was especially developed not to pass through by the slum dwellings of the people who worked in the factories. Mm -hmm. So that the bosses and their wives in going shopping wouldn't be disturbed to see the squalor in which the workers who were giving them the money to live in their grand houses were living. That's what we want to do, isn't it? We want to not see how it all works. We don't want to join all the pieces together. Because then we realize we're implicated in what's going on. But what we do impacts other people. That's a freshness. That we touch and move. We're stopped in our tracks when we see other people's lives. Just as in that brief account of the, the early stage of the Buddha's life that I was giving yesterday, he's protected in the palace. And one day when he's out riding, he sees a sick person. <coughs> He sees the sick person. It, it, it doesn't just think, oh, these ordinary people, God knows what happens to them, it's nothing to do with me. He suddenly sees, oh, what is that? That person is not well. And that takes his thoughts into, I also could be not well. That could be a very self-referential thing. But it's also the sense of, if it happens to one person, it can happen to everyone. What is the real difference between that person and myself? Just concepts. It's only concepts that divide us. All our individuality is essentially conceptual because it's grounded in the decisions that we make. What unites us is an open awareness to the phenomenological field. And the less prejudice we bring to that field, the more we share in our world. And the more we live in our own personal maps, which are probably at least 50% neurotic, habitual in a, in a, in a self-limiting way, the more we seem to live in a world of one, with all our thoughts and memories and what I've understood about myself and what I need to have in order to be okay. And the repetition of that is, again, a massaging of my habitual, familiar sense of self. If I stay open to the freshness of the moment, I have to confront the staleness of my interpretation. Why am I privileging the familiar, what has been predictable according to my assumptions, over what is actually happening? Well, it's scary to be with what's fresh, because I don't know what's going to happen. But the fact is we've never really known what was going to happen. We've just fallen asleep and avoided that uncomfortableness by entering a land of dreams and projections. <coughs> and as long as this map or dream world has had some sort of connection, some contiguity with what's going on, we've somehow managed to, to get by. But actually, our assumptions are not very accurate in making sense of the world. What is happening is in fact all we have. Being alive means seeing the morning mist, feeling the freshness of the air, 
tasting the oats or the toast or whatever you have for breakfast, looking at people, seeing how they are. You know, when we see each other in the morning, we say, how are you? How did you sleep? If people were the same yesterday as they were today, we wouldn't have to say, how are you? We'd just say, oh, I know you. That doesn't sound quite as welcoming, does it? I know you. Sounds more like a policeman. I've got my eye on you. <laughs> but we say, how are you? Because at least we accept that people can change. And we actually have to open the question rather than come up with the answer. And if you ask the question, and it's not just a, a sort of way of avoidance, for example, in the 1930s, if somebody said, how do you do? The only permitted reply was, how do you do? To actually say something about how you do would be very, very rude. Ah, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Ah. You know, because life is best if, if ships pass by in the night. As soon as you encounter another person, then the choreography of social interaction gets interrupted. Because somebody says, actually, I feel like shit. My life's not going well at all. Oh. You can't just slip over that. It stops you. You think, what's happening? Now I'm late, I'm going to run to, but this person is suffering. Should I be interrupted? In the Bible, they've got the story of the Good Samaritan, who's on his journey, traveling on the road. It's a long road, he's tired and weary, and he sees this sick person lying there. He doesn't pass by, he stops and asks, and he sees that the person is from another grouping, a grouping that his group is an enemy to. But he stopped. He's stopped by their pain and their suffering, and he feels an undeniable connection. And therefore, in seeing the other person, he allows the other to interrupt himself. This is very important from the, the point of view of meditation, because this is the basis of compassion. Compassion means being interrupted. Wisdom means never being interrupted. So how do you bring these two things together? How can awareness, openness, be uninterrupted? But how can we allow our life plans, our being in the world with others, to be shifted this way and that because of how things are? Somebody's suddenly sick or something happened. And we have to drop our plans to be there for them. Which brings us again to the question of choices. Lovely. <laughs> now we're interrupted. This is how I should be. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a bomb. Yes, it is. So. <laughs> Being interrupted brings us back to choices, because how do we give value to the various pressures that come on to us in the course of a day? How much time or how much of the extra mile can we give to all the various people who we meet who have troubles and difficulties? This is where the infinity of the heart or the infinity of love, the infinity of awareness has to enter into relationship with the finite nature of our embodied energy. Because if you, if you give too much, you're going to get burnt out. So how can you give a finite amount of time and energy, which is actually all we have, with an infinite openness of the heart? That's the, the way in which one can remain centered and fully available, even when one's saying, I can give you 10 minutes. Because if we really give the person 10 minutes and we're not distracted by other thoughts, mm. that 10 minutes could be the vehicle for the rich infinity of our heart to go out to them, to connect with them and to do as much as is possible. So fresh means, again, being fully there in the moment and allowing the moment to ceaselessly open and reveal new possibilities. The third aspect that I'll touch on just now is uh, raw. Raw means not cooked. 
means nothing is done to it. The mind itself doesn't need to be prepared. We don't need to prepare ourselves for awakening because the natural affection or the infinite openness of the mind can't be improved. What we need to do is to release the coverings. That is to say, to allow experience to be raw, we have to stop cooking. We have to stop adding ingredients. We have to stop being the chef. The chef means also the chief, the one who's in charge, <coughs> the one who makes the decision. More salt, more pepper, some herbs. We have a lot of knowledge and experience, all of us in this room got many memories of things, we know about different things. We can bring these into the situation. We interpret. Interpret means to put in the middle, doesn't it? You it you stick something in the middle. You, it's a way of both joining things, but also of separating. It creates a, a, a cordon sanitaire, a, a middle band between the immediacy of the meeting of self and environmental field. Why do we interpret? Because we want to make sense of what is going on. I, I want to understand what you're trying to say to me. That could be a, a precious gift or it could be an insult. Just listen. Don't have to think, just listen. I've said it. Yeah, but I don't quite understand. That's your problem, no mind. <laughs> the fact that you can't hear what I'm saying is you, it's not me. Your struggle to understand me means now you're going to add more of your thoughts onto what I said in order to understand clearly what I said. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's very different. Isn't it? If it's raw, it is what it is. Can we stay with that raw immediacy, which is true spontaneity, true freshness? False freshness is impulsivity, it's distraction, arousal, <clears throat> not being settled in oneself, so that one's constantly manifesting one's own themes. But the spontaneity of connection is raw. It just is. You meet someone and you have that particular kind of conversation. And if you're connected with them, all you could possibly have was what happened. Afterwards, you might think, oh, I could have said this, I should have said that. Mm -hmm. But in the actual moment, if you're really connected, the, the communication you have is the one that belongs in that moment. It is the authentic manifestation of the possibility of connection in that place, at that time, with these resources, in our mood, at the time of the year, at the time of the day, and so on. What we can conceptually think about afterwards and think about what we can do is uh, difficult because it adds uh, an abstraction. It's one of the central questions in supervision in psychotherapy, for example, because somebody brings some kind of account of a session to someone else who then tries to open it up or runs across it with different ideas. The supervisor usually is rather more experienced than the supervisee and they often, if they're anxious, try to correct what the therapist is doing and say, well, why don't you do this? Well, the only reply from the supervisee really can be, well, why don't you do it? I'll give you the patient. I can't do what you do. I can only do what I do. And I will have to learn on the job. That's all there is, isn't it? You have to learn on the job. You start not knowing and you manage to do the kind of openness and freshness because you don't know. And that has a particular flavor to it. If you've been doing it for 10 years or 20 years, you now do it 
with more confidence and more ease because you know what you're doing. But some of the freshness that you had when you began in your first sessions, you've lost. You can't have it both ways. We always just do what we can do. The main issue is, are we there in our particular constellation? Are we inhabiting what we are offering? Is it heartfelt? Because if we're just going through the motions, it's going to be limited. But we, all we have is the rawness of the moment. If you, if you make it artificial, if you put on a show, you will be cheating yourself and you'll be cheating the other person. But of course we do that. We, we're anxious about other people's opinions of us. We want to impress them. We want them to like us. And therefore, we might try to work out what do I have to do in order to make you happy? Generally, that's not a bad intention. But if it's driven not by a true altruism, a true concern about the state of the other, but is drawn, uh, is, is driven by a, a kind of feedback loop in, if I give you what you like, then you will like me, then we see that there's something a bit perverse in, in, inside that. So, in being raw, it means that we have to be freshly in touch with the uh, distorting patterns which when we get caught up in them distort our interaction with others and this is why when we do the meditation practice we're just relaxing and opening we're not trying to do anything except to find more and more openness to being with however we are with whatever we are because if only if we can accept all of that and allow each aspect of ourselves to take its proper place, to be its proper size, then there is going to be some kind of block to connection with the other. So, for example, if you hate yourself in some way or you feel that you're a bit stupid or a bit dumb or you feel you can't control your emotions. That internal position, that sort of internal dialogue, is going to inflate that aspect of yourself. You're becoming a bit hypervigilant, a bit oversensitive around that issue, and so it's distorting the total field because you're overprivileging something you're worried about. When you do that, as you move towards the other, instead of having a relaxed openness, there's a, a, an attempt to hide the things you don't want other people to see. And of course, you're hiding it by privileging other things and smoothing them over, creating a, a facade or a veneer that you hope will, will uh, hide whatever it is you're worried about from the other. That's not real availability. <laughs> that is a, a very partial welcome. When I was a child in our house, we had the front room and then we had the back room. And most of the time we were in the back room, but if someone came to visit, they went into the front room. And so nobody ever got to know how we lived. <laughs> because they always went into a room that we didn't live in. So that's this, the same thing that we can do psychologically. You have this persona or this facade, but so much of ourselves is hidden because we, we are embarrassed about things, or we don't feel good about something. And the real advantage of this kind of meditation is it allows us to be at home with ourselves, warts and all. We are what we are. We have limitations, we have our envies, our jealousies, our desires. It's part of the picture. These aren't things that you can get scissors and snip off and become this perfect circle something without any edges or pop marks in it. We're not going to be like that. And in fact, nobody's like that. And in fact, if you follow the scandals in the Catholic Church or the Methodist Church in America or many Buddhist centers in, in America and Britain and India, the scams are all related to people pretending that they're better than they are. 
pretenses is uh, profoundly unethical. Uh, it's, it's a kind of uh, unhelpful social adaption in the service of the ego. And through the practice of meditation, we should try to be more available. That doesn't mean just dumping our stuff in a raw way on other people and saying, well, it's up to you to cook it if you don't like the taste. That's, that's simply uh, rude and crude and aggressive. Rather, it's allowing the, uh, the potential which is in the raw to become an ingredient in what is going to transpire between you. And that takes, that takes some courage. But of course, uh, the courage to present oneself in as direct and simple a way as possible is a courage which is towards life. And, but the energy directed towards covering ourselves up and pretending is an energy directed towards death. Because you can't be fully alive if you're pretending. And that's a, a real sadness. And when we are alive, we're like these trees. We're all carrying our history. We have our distortions. We're gnarled. We have internal and external wrinkles and sagging bits and so on. We're not the ideal shape that we thought we might be. And that's what we are. And if we all have to pretend to each other that we're different from how we are, that's something quite pernicious and malicious and, and, and fundamentally undermining of any possibility of opening. Because how can you open if in order to feel safe you have to stay closed? absolute contradiction in terms. So there is uh, a courage to be. It does require a courage of acceptance. This is what I am. This is how my life is. I can imagine many other possibilities and sometimes that imagining is useful and compassionate but what is the raw state of my existence? What age we are, what strengths we have, what weaknesses we have, that is what it is. And if we're not prepared to know that, it'll be very difficult for us to have authentic communication with other people. So these uh, three aspects are our own nature. This is not some abstract theory, it's not a dogma, it's something you can inquire into again and again. These uh, ideas are offered really as kind of metaphors to to allow you to move around yourself and just look from different positions. And the, the main thing is you won't know yourself unless you <coughs> hang out with yourself. Mm -hmm. Hanging out with yourself means not being in the front parlor. It means being in the back room, in the kitchen, seeing the dirty dishes, observing yourself in all the times of the day and just observing, just noting, oh, this is how I am. This is the real meaning of Vipassana or Lakdo means seeing clearly, means just to accept this is how I am. Then with that, the form of how I am is recognized as inseparable from the ground, which is empty. So this is how I am in the manner of a dream, like the reflection of moon on water, like a mirage, like a rainbow in the sky, like an echo like the child of a barren woman, like the horns on a hare. It's like something which is not truly there and yet can appear to be there. And if we see this, then that can be a great courage because the thing is not to be a kind of heroic warrior. It's not that we're trying to overcome difficulties. It's not a macho expedition. Rather, it's just tolerant, patient, accepting openness. This is how it is. <clears throat> okay, we're just about at time for a break. Um, there's a, a website called Simply Being where you can find lots of uh, old transcripts uh, in different languages of uh, talks and things that I've done. And that's uh, yeah. available free and um, there's also some recordings and books here. 
the purpose of, of this work is really to for all of us to loosen up. So it's not that you have to study lots and lots and lots of books and texts, but sometimes they can help. The main object of study is yourself. What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to have a mind? And if we can really see our own functioning, the clarity of that helps us to have clarity to observe other people as they function. And that feeds into the heart of the practice. Okay, shall we have a break? <laughs> Okay, <coughs> so in the Odyssey, uh, Homer tells how the great hero who couldn't leave anything alone has heard tell of the sirens who sing on the rocks and call uh, and seduce sailors to their doom on the rocks. And he decides he has to allow himself to hear this song. But he comes up with a very good solution. He gets the crew to tie him to the mast. And all the crew have to put wax in their ears. So they set off rowing towards the rocks where the sirens are. And as soon as Odysseus hears their song, he says, go that way, go that way. But the rowers have wax in their ears. So they just <laughs> and uh, this is the, uh, what we have to do in meditation. We have to be these two aspects. We have to be open to life, to hear all the temptations, otherwise we become very artificial. But at the same time, we have to stay on track. So what we've been describing is that our way of doing that is to use the openness as the grounding and the flexibility of response as the urge to move in different directions. And as long as our responsiveness is inseparable from openness, we're not going to crash onto the rocks. But when our arousal, when our impulsivity takes over, when we lose our own ground and we hurl ourselves into the tumult of life, and because of that we get difficulties. So <clears throat> I think that's the, the central issue for us to do in the practice. So I would invite you now to uh, talk together in pairs and think about two things. If you have a, a, an intention to develop the practice and carry it forward, given what you know about yourself, what could get in the way of you doing sitting practice on a reasonably regular basis, but also what could get in the way of you applying or integrating that practice with your everyday life? You know, how, how might you sabotage yourself? In, this is about your unique knowledge of your own patterns, your avoidances, and so on. Okay, so I invite you to spend a little time trying to explore that, and then we can discuss together some strategies for dealing with some of it. <laughs> Thank you.